Okay. All right. Um, so I'm delighted to um, welcome you um, to Columbia University and to the conference on democratic politics and um, the problem of mistrust in experts. Um, I'm even more delighted to see uh, many friends and intellectual companions here, some who have crossed the Atlantic to get here, some have just crossed Broadway. And let us not forget, uh, you know, about, I'm not sure what's exactly the number, but there are people on Zoom that are also joining us right now. Um, so thank you all for coming, however long or short was the trip. Um, I, I feel certain that this is an extraordinary gathering of minds here, and that um, thanks to you, it, it is impossible that for it not to be fruitful. Um, now, I've been looking forward for this gathering for quite a long time. Um, in fact, six and a half years to be precise. So um, yesterday, I spent some time looking at my email folder, dialing backwards and realizing that um, Tom uh, Medvedz and I submitted a proposal to Oxford University Press um, for what we innocently called at the time a handbook on expertise um, in August 2016. Um, and quite a lot happened in between. Well, the name of the book changed, the world changed, the name of the book changed to fit a uh, changed world. Um, I wrote another book. Uh, Harry and Robert here probably wrote four or five other books in between. Uh, and, and another thing happened um, along the way, and it is reflected in the name that we chose for the, for the conference. Um, what began as an inquiry into the sociology of expertise has sort of subtly shifted to focus more and more on the problem of trust. Um, this came as a surprise, at least to me, probably not a surprise to Ted Porter, uh, who has been down this road already about uh, several decades before us. Um, but at least for me, the realization that I needed to address the problem of trust um, was brought home by the commotion of the Trump years and Brexit before that and the, um, um, you know, and, and other events. So I, I took a dive into this topic uh, with a chapter in my book in, in the, um, a two-year uh, Mellon seminar on trust and mistrust in science and experts and an undergraduate course on this. And as I was preparing all of these, the pandemic hit. Um, and almost immediately with the pandemic, uh, there was another pandemic, which was a, a sort of a, a trust talk. A lot of trust talk was happening. Everybody began to talk about trust and mistrust. Uh, there were calls for the public to trust experts. There were hand wringing uh, about the lack of trust in experts. There were moral panics about um, the mistrust in experts. There were survey results um, documenting declines in public trust and cross national surveys, ranking countries on their levels of trust in experts in science, in the government, et cetera. Um, I began to receive calls from newspapers and uh, radio shows and CNN and even Facebook um, asking for expertise about trust. Um, and all this trust talk was plugged back into politics. Um, as Andy Lakoff will sh talk about, I think, a little bit later today, um, the regulatory science bureaucracy has used um, invoke trust to shield itself from uh, political meddling. The Biden administration also um, burnished its credentials with uh, depicting itself as working with trusted messengers. Trust talk became lingua franca. Um, and this experience is reflected in the handbook, I think. Um, many of the chapters, including the introduction that Tom and I wrote, um, have been envisioned originally as sort of kind of authoritative summaries of the literature on expertise, but have now, so, so they were about, you know, what we know about expertise, but now they have swung to become forays into what we do not know about trust and how to study it. Um, now, and more urgently, the handbook is animated by a sense that uh, the problem of trust is key to the survival and health of democratic, of liberal democracies. It was the experience of the Trump, Trump years, 
um, as well as Brexit before that, and now the spread of liberal democracy from you know, Hungary to my own native Israel, that has brought home the extent to which science and expertise are, as Harry Collins put it, part of the system of checks and balances that um, shows up confidence in, in well-functioning democracy. So alongside the constitutionally codified branches, the legislative, the executive, the judicial, liberal democracy is also safeguarded by informal checks and balances, including the fourth estate of the media and the fifth estate, uh, the fifth branch of science, especially regulatory science, and perhaps others. Yet uh, the informal branches lack the constitutionally mandated powers of the other branches. They can perform the crucial role um, as checks and balances only as long as they enjoy trust and command the respect of the citizenry. Um, in all the trust surveys that I've seen, trust in Congress is the lowest, right? It's at the bottom. And I don't think this is not, not important, and I don't think it doesn't impact the way Congress uh, functions. But at the end of the day, Congress does have its constitutionally mandated powers and can command respect. And you, at least behaviorally, you should show it if you're subpoenaed um, in front of Congress. The media or science are much more uh, reliant on trust. As Emil Durkheim warned uh, more than a century ago, all the scientific demonstrations in the world would have no influence if a people had no faith in science. And we can add all the constitutionally mandated powers in the world will be of no avail in a public health crisis um, if regulatory science cannot rely upon the public's trust. I think we've just been through that. Ergo, if you want to destroy democracy, undermining trust in science and expertise is as good a place as any to start with the demolition. In fact, it's an excellent place to start um, for a would-be dictator because um, science and expertise are more vulnerable for a variety of reasons uh, than other institutions, as we have seen over the last few years. Um, now, almost all cultures have uh, uh, some version of another of the saying according to which trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. It would seem to be that liberal democracies are now in the demoralizing forever to repair uh, stage. Um, and now let's not take forever literally. Uh, what it really means is that we do not know how to do this and uh, how to recover trust. And that it seems to involve some sort of a collective bootstrapping exercise that somehow needs to overcome this asymmetry um, in which the effort of time required to build trust is, is um, profoundly disproportionate to how easy it is to break it. Um, therefore, the maintenance of democracy guardrails requires us to think deeply about the nature of trust and devise new and better tools to address it. Uh, this conference doubles as a, also a launch event for the uh, new center, the Trust Collaboratory, uh, that seeks to respond to this uh, need. The collaboratory is housed, housed within um, the Interdisciplinary Center for Innovative Theory and Empirics, or INSIGHT, which is above us in this building. Um, and as the name implies, the Trust Collaboratory, the mandate involves um, not just research on trust, but uh, also public engagement. In fact, when it comes to trust, I, I don't think that it makes sense um, to make a strong distinction between research and public engagement. Everything we already know about trust uh, indicates that it is created through engagement, through dialogue, uh, through listening, through staying for the long haul. Um, this means that trust cannot only be the subject of our research, um, it also must be part of a lived scholarly practice, hence the Trust Collaboratory has formed working relationships with community partners in New York City um, and, and some community organizations. Another reason why research on trust should be intertwined with public engagement is that knowledge on tr about trust is broadly distributed in society. Trust is something that ordinary people do know about quite a, quite a bit. And this is especially true for certain categories of workers, often low level and poorly paid, who staff the access point of expert systems. 
So accompanying this conference, there is this exhibition at the back that Christian curated. Uh, it's called Trust Workers. And um, it, it's still doing the rounds in, in New York City. So when New York City was in the middle of the pandemic um, and there was concern about vaccination rates, we started working with uh, community health workers, CHWs, on a project that was at one and the same time public engagement, trust building, and research on trust, sort of aggregating social knowledge on trust that is held by people who work with trust uh, and mistrust on a daily basis, but whose voices are not often, uh, not usually heard, and their tacit knowledge is not usually made explicit. So the idea was that because of their intermediary position, CHWs know more about trust than perhaps we do. Um, they are trust workers. So this is why we designed this photo voice exhibition um, in which CHWs talked about their understanding of trust and illustrated with photos that they took. You can see a sample of it in the back. Um, now, the final part uh, of my comment is to thank all the people and organizations that were involved in making today possible. So uh, first I would like to uh, thank Tom Medvitz, um, who co-edited the handbook with me. Um, we go back a long way. Uh, Tom was a PhD student in Berkeley when I was a junior faculty there. Um, but this was the first time we actually got to really work together. Um, and um, I couldn't have wished for a better collaborator. Uh, I may be senior to him in years, but uh, he is the one who really shepherded this whole process uh, with a sure hand. And he spent hours, may I say, contributors, he spent hours on your papers um, and his fingerprints are all over the handbook. Immense thanks are also due to Christian Caputescu, the Associate Director of the Trust Collaboratory. Uh, Christian came here only, one, for, only for one year um, as a postdoc for the aforementioned uh, um, Mellon seminar. This is now his second year. Quietly but irresistibly, uh, inescapably, he has made himself indispensable, irreplaceable. He has been an absolute revelation. There is nothing that Christian can't do. Um, from designing a survey to curating an exhibition, from speaking to a room full of CHWs to getting Columbia's forum for free, um, to leading a motley crew of students, scholars, and CHWs to publish in a public philosophy journal. And by the way, if this conference looks good, if the poster, the slides are shiny and everything works smoothly, that's his work as well. So thank you, Christian. Um, <laughs> thanks are also due to... Um, the organization that supported this conference, financially speaking, everything was made possible uh, by a grant from the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, ISAP. I'd like to thank the co-directors, Matt Conley and Alessandra Casella uh, and the staff. In the actual planning uh, and administrative tasks, we were supported by the staff of the Department of Sociology. I'd like to thank uh, Teresa Aguayo, Winston Gordon, Veronica Gamboa, and Tania Pabona Costa for all the work that they did to make sure that the contributors are taken care of. I'd like to thank the staff of Insight, especially the director, Peter Berman, sitting there, uh, for opening the doors to us, offering space and, and support also for today and for tomorrow's debrief. I'd like to thank Rebecca Felder and uh, Robert Carrillo. They helped set this whole thing up. Um, and I also, uh, there's just a few more thanks and then I'm done. I also would like to thank the PhD students in the Department of Sociology who are helping to run the show today. Um, Diane Sheng and Anna Tizer, the organizer of the SCAT workshop and Ari Galper, the organizer of our Sociology of Algorithms workshop. Uh, um, not only they diligently advertise this conference, but they will also assist in organizing the Q&A for each of the panels, especially from the Zoom. Um, special thanks are due also to the discussants, uh, Pamela Smith, Alma Steingart, and Diane Vaughn. Um, we will introduce you later, but I'd like to say thanks right now because you came through, even though I asked you in the last minute. Uh, so thanks again, I really appreciate that. And of course, thanks to the contributors who came um, from all over 
to speak today. So I am done, and I think Tom will come uh, and introduce the first panel. Hello, um, I'm Tom, Tom Medvets, and um, our the theme of our first panel is democracy and expertise. And we're delighted to have a roster of very distinguished speakers. I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn right before their talk, um, as well as the discussant. So our first paper, which is titled The Value of Truth, Science as Institution, and inspiration is by professors Harry Collins and Robert Evans. Professor Collins is distinguished research professor in the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University, a fellow of the British Academy, and the author of more than 100 scholarly articles and roughly 20 books, the latter including Gravity's Ghost, Scientific Discovery in the 21st Century. Robert Evans is professor at the School of Social Sciences, also at Cardiff University, and a founding contributor to what is known as the third wave of science studies. His work has appeared in a range of journals, including Social S Studies of Science and the British Journal of Sociology. And he and Professor Collins are co-authors of several books, including 2007's Rethinking Expertise, and more recently, why democracies need science. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks very much to, to Gil and Tom for both the invitation to take part in the, the handbook and obviously for the invitation to be here today. Um, thanks also to Gil for the introduction. I thought you were going to steal all our best lines there at one point, but you you say something for us to say. Um, so here's the overview of, of what's coming up. Essentially, I'm going to do the first two bullet points, and then Harry's going to take the, the final bullet point, which is more, more than new stuff. The first two are really about the, the handbook chapter. Okay, so as Tom says, it's not going to come as a surprise to you that the, um, the chapter is rooted in the third wave of science studies paper that Harry and I published over 20 years ago. Those of you familiar with that paper will be really relieved to know that we're not going to attempt to summarize all of it. Um, we're just going to talk about one, one thing. So the bit we're going to talk about is what we termed at the time the problems of legitimacy and the problem of extension. So what do these refer to? Well, the problem of legitimacy, this occurs when experience-based expertise from outside the scientific community is ignored by decision makers, and then the, you know, the subsequent decision is seen as illegitimate because it, precisely because it doesn't include this important and relevant expertise. The problem of extension is kind of the opposite problem, and it's what happens when decision makers give too much weight to people who've got no relevant specialist expertise at all, whether that's scientific or experience-based expertise. And the point is, as the slide tries to illustrate, is that these problems are linked in the sense that successfully solving one also means successfully solving the other because you've got the right balance. So if you draw the boundaries of relevant expertise too tightly and exclude people, you end up with a problem of legitimacy. If you draw them too, too loosely or not at all, then you end up including too many people and then you end up with a problem of extension. So the problem is solved when you get, get, the, balance, get the balance right. So this is kind of how we, we set it up at the time back in 2002. I mean, at the time, and I think quite rightly, the problem of legitimacy was the kind of thing that dominated the SGS literature at the time. And if you looked up from the SGS literature and looked at the world outside, you could see exactly why the problem of legitimacy was the one that we were mostly concerned with. In contrast, I think the problem of extension, that's to say cases where decision makers pay too little attention to science and expertise, and I think certainly for me personally, and I think to some extent Harry as well, when we wrote the third wave paper, it was as much a logical problem as it was a practical problem. There weren't too many examples of it out there in the real world, but it seemed to us to be a kind of kind of a logical or a theoretical problem. What would you do if, or how would you deal with this problem if it were to be the case? Um, sadly, as, as Gil's introduction has, has made clear, if this kind of statement was true at the time, then it's certainly not true anymore. I guess what we would see, the connection that we would make, is that the, the rise in populism is the emergence of the problem of extension on a widespread scale. 
and vice versa, I suppose. Um, rather than scientists and other experts having too much influence on policymaking, the worry now is that they're too easily discounted. And I've picked climate change as, as an example. It's as good a one as any. And I suppose the, the question that, that Harry and I would, would pose to you um, about this would be, well, who do you think political leaders should turn to for advice on climate change? And why do you think they should turn to those groups? And I think more to the point, particularly in the context of a sort of professional STS conference, assuming that we all agree it's the IPCC and not the Heartland Institute, what does STS, as the professional academic scholarly discipline concerned with the social study of science and technology, what does STS have to say about why we think it should be the case that policymakers should listen to the IPCC when they want to know about the state of climate change? So essentially the key claim that we're making in the handbook chapter is that STS should indeed have something to say about this problem of extension in much the same way as it's got something to say about the problem of legitimacy. And what I'm going to do, I just finish off my segment of the talk, is to give you a sort of summary of how we make that argument. So the first thing we need to do is we need to distinguish between democracy and populism. And it's superficially similar, um, and perhaps this is where the, some of the confusion and controversy comes from. They're superficially similar in the sense that both of them claim to represent the people and to be critical of elites and vested interests. Where they differ, however, is in their tolerance for the diversity of views within the societies over which they have jurisdiction. So in general, we would argue that democracies value pluralism and have a higher tolerance for diversity than populist regimes do. Crucially, democracies manage the problems that this pluralism inevitably creates by accepting, as Gil alluded to earlier on, a series of checks and balances that limit the power of any one group or institution. And we see the key difference with populist regimes being that populist regimes don't value this diversity. They don't value these checks and balances. And generally speaking, will work to subvert and undermine, the, undermine these checks and balances, which are kind of represented as barriers to the enactment of the will of the people, and therefore something that needs to be undermined, discredited, removed, or whatever. And so, as Gil alluded to, really, what's going on, we think, um, and this is why science and technology studies has a, has a particularly important and relevant role in these kinds of debates, is that undermining the idea of expertise, undermining the credibility or the trust in science, enables this kind of paradoxical situation in which you've got this apparent increase in pluralism because you've got more and more voices being, uh, being heard and give, um, achieving prominence. So it looks like more pluralism. What it's actually doing is it's undermining the very system of checks and balances that makes pluralist democracies work in the first place. So our argument would be that by failing to distinguish between different kinds and levels of expertise, undermining the idea of expertise in general um, and undermining the idea of science in particular, what this then does, it reduces the effectiveness of the checks and balances because you've got no reason to value one, one kind of science or one kind of knowledge over another. And that in turn makes the abuse of power much easier because one of the things that might have prevented it is now much weaker. Okay, so we're not saying this is the only way that populist regimes undermine the institutional checks and balances of pluralist democracies. But I think what we are saying is it's the one that STS ought to be particularly concerned about because it's the one that speaks most directly to the expertise that we would claim to have. So this brings us back to our problem. What can or should STS do about it? Well, we know that we can't simply go back to the wave one idea that everyone should just try get on and trust science because it's more true than everything else. We know that's not the way to approach it. So instead, we have to build on what STS has already shown us about science, the nature of science, um, and to think about, well, how can we defend a science or an institution that we know to be socially constructed in ways that reflect dominant groups and interests? So in order to work it out, I suppose, we have to try and answer this sort of question. Are there reasons, ways of thinking that allow us to give some account of why we might prefer some socio-technical orders to others. Why are some, are all socio-technical orders equal or are some better than others? And if some are better than others, why is that? And how can we relate that back to STS scholarship? So the way in which, way in which we do it anyway, is based on sociological understanding of the nature of social groups and social groups as being constituted by shared aspirations and values that give them their identity as social groups. What do we share as members of the group that makes us members of that group? And Crucially, we would argue that the reasons 
that matter, at least in the case of science, are moral rather than epistemic reasons. And for that reason, they don't lead us to having to argue that science is more true than other science than other other kinds of knowledge. So these are this table is taken from the book that um, Tom mentioned, Why Democracies Need Science. And it's a list of the values that we think kind of constitute um, the scientific form of life. And our argument is essentially that these are more good than the alternative. And what we mean by more good is that they are good in ways that their opposites are not. So it's morally better to try and ground your knowledge in observation than refuse to do this. It's morally better to have knowledge that is open to test and scrutiny than simply refuse to allow your claims to be tested in any way, shape or form at all. It's better that knowledge workers are honest than if they lie, things like that. And what we're arguing essentially is to the extent that these scientific values shape and inform scientific practice, and we're not saying that you can take that for granted, but we're saying that it should, um, and it's something that we should encourage and work towards, then to the extent that that is true, then the outcome is better in the moral sense than knowledge that's produced in other ways. And so what we're arguing, at least in the context of providing technical advice, so again, it's in this context of providing advice to policymakers or decision makers about the state of the world, scientific or expert knowledge should indeed be valued more highly than advice produced in other ways. And I suppose just to sum up and, and provide a little link to what Harry's going to say, in a sense, what we're saying is if we know that social orders are moral orders, then why don't we reverse the argument and use moral questions to shape society? So if I press that, it's you now, Harry. Um, so it's the, down, the downward arrow. So just to finish this off, I, you know, <clears throat> life, let me tell you, life is short. When Rob said, we published this paper more than 20 years ago. I suddenly thought, what? <laughs> more than 20 years ago? Yeah, life really is short. And uh, this is, you know, we've just been pressing on and pressing on ever since that 2002 paper to do more stuff along the same lines. And this is where we've got to now. We're uh, trying to write a book called Establishing Veritocracy. Uh, and this is some, just some ideas from it. Uh, uh, we've tried to give it some uh, academic respectability by miraculously discovering that there may be some roots for it in Durkheim, in Durkheim's lectures, which he gave from the 1890 onwards, and which wound up being published a few times in a book uh, called Professional Ethics and Civic Morals. And what Durkheim was doing was trying to uh, cope with anime by saying, well, maybe we could get some values and order back in society from the professions, uh, from the ethical uh, ethics of the professions. Uh, but he did notice that professions differ as professors. This is Durkheim speaking, and he was speaking French, of course. As professors, we have duties which are not those of merchants. Those of industrialists are quite different from those of the soldier. Those of the soldier from those of the priest and so on. There is as many forms of morals as there are different callings. And we can kind of claim that we're doing something, some generalization of this in our notion of the fractal model of society. I can't remember. We've been talking about this for a long, for quite a long time, but I can't tell you where we first published it. So I can't remember at the moment. But the fractal model of society aren't, is it an attempt to answer the question, well, you know, what is a social group? Is it a big thing like a nation or is it a small thing uh, like a group of hobbyists? And the answer is, well, think of it. Don't, answer, don't ask that question. Instead, think of it like a fractal, that in fact society is a fractal-like model of social groups all mutually embedded with one, one another. And in this diagram, starting at large social groups and getting down to a very, very small social groups and going down all the way in a kind of cascade. Uh, and when you get to the bottom, well, a fractal, uh, the usual example of physical fractals are things like cauliflowers and Norwegian fjords. Um, when you finally get down to the bottom of the cauliflower, all you've got is a few cells. You haven't got a florid. You know, you've got smaller florets within smaller florets within smaller florets and so on. Then you get a few cells. And with the case of Norwegian fjords, there's fjords within fjords within mini fjords within mini fjords, and then you eventually get down to a few grains of sand. Well, society is a bit like this. And so we say this is this is our picture of society. It's this fractal model with lots and lots of social groups with their own 
social understanding is embedded with each other and yet all the social groups taken together are at the same time to society at the top end you've got some, something like a nation state with its way of being with its natural language and it's distinct and if you, it, it, this isn't just wishful thinking you can tell whether something is a social group or is just shall we say just a set of people so a set of people will be all the people here who have shoelaces in their shoes as opposed to the people who don't have shoelaces in their shoes but they're not a group they're a set the groups you can tell whether you've got a group by trying an imitation game on them an imitation game being the predecessor of the turing test you just get people who aren't members of the group to pretend to be members of the group and see if they can pass as members of the group and if it's reasonable to ask whether that makes sense then you've got a group but you would not wouldn't try that with shoelace wearers because all they've got to do is just tell a lie which is a very simple thing to do so that's the fractal model of society and uh there it is again and uh, how do we how does is the fractal model of society assuming it exists using sts well you can see that the national the social group which is the nation state affects the subgroups that grow out of it the secondary socialization groups that people get in schools and and uh, universities and so on uh in particular science depends on the national uh culture it depends for instance on primary socialization where you learn the building blocks of moral order of you you learn the building blocks it's important you, you'll never learn a language you'll never learn your native language unless you already have the building block of building blocks of truth because otherwise your parents can say that's a chair oh no that's an elephant no 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 that's a tiger no 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 you know anything they like they've got to tell the truth for you to even learn the names of things so uh, there'd be no science without that basic socialization but sts has become sort of obsessed recently by feeding the whole of society into science it's all unidirectional people are worried about how can we democratize science how can we make it more democratic how can we bring the people you know the people into science so that you're no longer left with this elite whereas what we're trying to do is think about the other way remember this is society and that's just the right hand panel is society as well but that means it works upwards as well as downwards that what's happening in all the subgroups are feeding back into what's becoming the nature of the state and in particular we're concerned with how science feeds back upwards and that's what we call and because we we are claiming we're going to claim in the next society that society is an institution which is quintessentially concerned with truth if it wasn't quintessentially concerned with truth, it wouldn't be science any longer okay it can feed truth back up into society and it can be you respect for science can be used to establish a veritocracy so uh, well i'll go through this very quickly because you're not going to believe it anyway if it's done very very quickly but the formative aspiration of science is to find universal correspondence truth as a result of my case 45 year case study of the detection of gravitational waves i can tell you as a as a a finding that in gravitational wave physics people discover that if they're going to have any chance of finding correspondence truth in respect of gravitational waves they're going to have to be truthful themselves in terms of relaying their findings and their experimental results to their colleagues uh, so that's why truth is fundamental science and then quite a lot follows from that which i won't bother with okay sociologists historians and philosophers of knowledge philosophers of knowledge should be are or should be concerned with finding the bottom turtle okay and what we are saying in the third wave is that bottom turtle or something close to the bottom turtle science used to be way back after world war ii the main candidate to be the bottom turtle the world there is is of course knowledge the second wave spoiled that party second wave of science studies but the third wave is trying to work its way back to science
by claiming, as Rob said, that the basic moral certainties are the nearest we'll get to the bottom turtle and truth is best found in the institution of science. Not certainty, not with certainty, but it is a way to bet. Uh, all this rests on an ideal, idealized notion of science, which I have to say, my 45 year study of gravitational wave physics concluded that that group was something very close to the ideal. Now, we were used to dealing with other kinds of science issues which are very far from the ideal, but that one's close. Uh, but at least, even if you don't believe that science fits the ideal very well, it solves the epistemological problem, which wave two gave us. It tells us where in society we can start looking for people trying to find truth, if not actually finding it. It allows us to climb out of the postmodernist pit in which Trump, Putin, and I'm afraid some of our colleagues in STS have tried to sink us. Uh, of course, some scientists are corrupt. Some scientists are corrupt and every science is under pressure to become corrupt. And one of our examples of corrupt science, if we get to finishing this book is economics and we'll discuss it at some length. Uh, and uh, it does not so that none of this gets us out of the need for constant vigilance, but maybe it helps with the vigilance. Uh, and you can't help it. I mean, the problem of vigilance is everywhere. The problem of vigilance is there with social media. Uh, the problem is, is there with art the latest artificial intelligence, the chat GPT and all that kind of stuff. And of course, it's always beset the problems of academic life. But uh, that's what we're trying to do here. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Peter Weingart, and the title of his paper is Crisis of Expertise, Crisis of Democracy, Comments on a Current Debate. Professor Weingart comes to us from uh, Bielefeld University in Germany, where he is Professor Emeritus in Sociology and the Emeritus Director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies of Science. Professor Weingart has written extensively on the dynamics of knowledge production, on the themes of public trust and accountability, and on the articulations between scientific discourse, politics, business, and the media. He is also the current editor of the journal Minerva. Thank you, Professor Weingart. Yeah, Tom and uh, Gil, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Brings me back to New York the first time since uh, I think it was in the year 2000, just two weeks before the attack on the World Trade Center. Uh, when you uh, uh, mentioned the history of this uh, conference and also the, the volume and especially the new focus on trust, uh, it reminds me that, uh, unfortunately, things were happening faster than I could follow, so to speak, because by now I'm involved in a project on trust uh, that we're doing, uh, where three universities are involved, uh, and uh, I'd be glad to comment on the next workshop on trust and the, the concept and the, uh, the implications that that has. <clears throat> Uh, I chose this, uh, these are just sort of a few remarks rather than a coherent uh, account, but I chose it because when you asked me, uh, I thought the, the paper that I had contributed to the book was already sort of uh, threatening to get out of touch with the uh, developments, so I'd rather sort of follow up on what's happening right now. The present diagnosis of a crisis of expertise uh, are only partly related to or triggered by the COVID pandemic or by populist reactions against experts. Actually, 
The history of the relation between science and politics, of course, is much longer. Uh, at the latest, it begins with Max Weber's uh, epistemic distinction between science and politics as a profession <clears throat> and the problematic legitimating function of science expertise in democracies of which we have just heard from uh, Terry and uh, yeah. Um, one could also mention Dom Price's analysis in view of an expanding advisory sector in the US government after the, the First World War. <laughs> he warned that science was going so fast that the democratic system would be undermined by an establishment of scientific experts. Since then, the warnings of a technocratic or expert-driven erosion and a crisis of expertise, scientific expertise, and that is uh, by populist anti-science politics alternate. On the German speaking scene, and I'll give you just uh, two examples. <clears throat> One, Alexander Bogner criticizes an epistemic epistemicization, if that makes sense in, in English. I think it doesn't. Uh, epistemisierung, he calls it in German, of politics. Uh, while admitting that profound scientific knowledge is in many cases the precondition of seriously participating in political debates. The wild protests of the science deniers are as useful um, are as useful a reminder that the real problems are not solved with scientific knowledge. This is good in his view for democracy. <clears throat> Kaspar Hirschi, the, the uh, Swiss historian, the second example claims that the recent cascade of crises has favored the historically unprecedented and democratically problematic epistemic and normative totalization of the role of expert. It is documented in the accumulation of roles of a medial prominence of experts whose members appear as intellectuals, advisors, and activists all at the same time. <clears throat> Gil Ayal has taken an important step to calm the excitement a bit, first by drawing the important distinction between general science and those disciplines which share relation with politics via advice, i.e. regulatory science and policy science. <clears throat> On the basis of this differentiation, he also speaks out against dramatizations such as Tom Nichols, who he declared the death of expertise. Thus, my question, what constitutes the actual crisis, or is there really a crisis of expertise and a crisis of democracy that follows from that? First, let me look at context of advice and the uncertainty of knowledge. One source of the critique of expertise is the uncertainty of knowledge. It counts as the gateway to the, to the illegitimate political influence of experts. Since all knowledge is uncertain and, un and scientific knowledge is never final, this uncertainty cannot be the issue. But below this level, the question is uncertainty of knowledge with respect to what? Gill's hint that we are not <clears throat> discussing quantum dynamics, but regulatory policy relevant knowledge, that points to the distinction between the hard and soft disciplines, which can be arranged on a continuum ranging from highly secure to largely speculative. However, the superficial view can be misleading. The highly sophisticated mathematics of physics, for instance, which was the, the methodical basis for modeling the course of infections during the corona pandemic, has not contributed to the differentiation of the occurrence of infections. Thus, all contacts 
were treated equally risky, equally risky, while a policy relevant breakdown of risks or contacts would have required social theory or social surveys, that is methods of the softer social sciences. <clears throat> The rigorousness of scientific methods can be compared in the abstract and ordered in a hierarchy, but it depends on the subject to which they are applied in the political context to assess their actual performance. <clears throat> Gill's differentiation implicitly points to yet another source of uncertainty, the context of application and the function of knowledge in the political process. Regulatory and policy relevant knowledge is related to decisions. Probably the greatest share of experts and their knowledge is connected to a regulatory action. The German constitution lists areas which cannot be regulated without recourse to scientific technical knowledge, air traffic, train traffic, weapons and explosives, the production and use of nuclear energy and others. Nuclear energy, as a matter of fact, till yesterday when Germany exited nuclear energy. One could differentiate here between regulation as administrative action after political decisions have been made and decisions preceding regulatory action for which knowledge is mobilized to decide between different options. For the use of regulatory knowledge, the underlying political decisions don't have to be constantly repeated and legitimated with expert knowledge. There is an automatic process of adaptation following the legal principle according to the state of science and technology. The German constitutional court has legally bound politics to ascertain the state of knowledge before making decisions that entail potential dangers to the citizenry. One could speak in this case of technocratic administration without that this could have been as expertocratic, could have been seen as expertocratic endangerment of democracy. Exceptions from this rule are only given when political controversies over threshold values, acceptable probabilities of risks emerge. Reference to scientific or expert knowledge to make political decisions unavoidably reveals the uncertainties of knowledge and at the same time, the different values and interests involved. If politics revert to expertise and counter expertise, the politicization of knowledge is already underway. The uncertainty of knowledge referred to in this in, in advice and its proneness for conflict is more pronounced the more diverse the interests of the recipients of the advice are, and possibly the greater media attention is. about forms of politicization of experts and expertise. The corona pandemic was an instructive test case. At its outbreak in February 2020, the population's trust in science increased under the deadly threat. The public support of the partly drastic measures, lockdowns suggested by virologists and epidemiologists was high. And I'm referring here mostly to the German case where it was above 70%, despite the fact that the political decisions had been made without parliamentary debate. But this constellation did not last long. Already by May, politicization began to set in, favored by a waning threat. As a matter of fact, we've done a an analysis of this development for three countries in a uh, comparative study, Germany, South Africa, and the US, if you want to follow this up. In other words, 
the exceptional situation of the first year of the pandemic, during which the dependence of policymakers on the few selected experts from biology and epidemiology was particularly strong, has not resulted in a continued erosion of democratic procedures to experts. And this in view of support for the government's decision by a concerned public. And other surveys show in the general public, the decisionist model of scientific advice to policymakers enjoys trust and popularity rather than the technocratic model as one could expect. At a closer look, <clears throat> other aspects appear that can be interpreted as a politicization of expertise. During the early phase of the pandemic, the selection of experts to advise the government was narrowed down to virologists, epidemiologists, and physicists, while the social sciences, sociology, political science, economics, and also psychology, by the way, <clears throat> remained excluded. This choice was criticized, but also defended. To include advice from the latter would have rendered political decision-making considerably more, more complex. In this phase of the pandemic in which no vaccine was yet available, the hammer of hard measures, this is a citation, was necessary. The political decision behind the choice of experts was comprehensible. Sometime later, in December 2021, an expert council was established, again, Germany, that included psychology, ethics, biology, and some others. The chancellor declared that this choice of experts would guarantee that, and I quote, the different aspects of decisions would be examined, thereby also creating more acceptance and transparency. Different types of politicization of expertise result from the legitimating power of scientific knowledge for politics, but that is ambivalent. It can also have a delegitimate function, that is, when the suggested solution does not agree with the political will of the respective government. We just have to remind ourselves of Donald's, Donald Trump's distancing from Anthony Fauci because he feared that, this, that his statistics would endanger his chances for re-election, but at the same time referring to the radiologist Scott Atlas. <laughs> the differentiation of forms of politicization points to the range of st strategic dealings of politics with scientific advice beyond its depoliticization. Likewise, the differentiation of forms of crises show that their public and political perceptions and the political reactions to them can take on very different forms. Different forms of crises can also be conceived as different types of problems governments face and or are prepared to tackle. Attempting to prevent or at least alleviate climate change can be seen as the wicked problem. State of research is complex. Numerous disciplines are involved. Many interests in different areas of policymaking have to be coordinated, et cetera, et cetera. This leads to new forms of advice, new constellations between governments, NGOs, and involved experts. The differentiation between wicked and tame problems runs at least roughly parallel to that between policy science and regulatory science <clears throat> or regulatory expertise. One could order this in a sort of dichotomous uh, table. Dichotomies are always too simple, but nonetheless, in this case, it might help, and one can differentiate between tame and wicked problems. The roles are specialist and expert. The certainty of knowledge is, at least in the first case, certain clear goals are formulated in the second case, uncertain and unclear goals, etc. 
And the regulatory application of science is most cases depoliticized and in other uh, in the case of wicked problems is of course politicized. It remains open if the populist anti-intellectualism and the rampant rejection of scientific expertise, if it exists at all, is a temporary phenomenon whose causes have to be seen in passing political developments, polarization, Brexit, pandemic, or if they constitute a fundamentally new relation between science and politics. So finally, on generalization and medialization of the role of expert in of giving advice. Three observations may get us closer to the answer. The first relates to the increase of advice for governments. The measures are, are disputed, but one figure from the German context may be indicative. In 2020 alone, costs that government pays for outside advice increased compared to the year before by 46% to 433 million euros. And a substantial part of that went to commercial companies such as McKinsey, Pricewaterhouse, Cooper, et cetera. Call this an outsourcing of expertise. There's a lot of literature on that. The second observation focuses on the generalization of the role of expert and the trivialization of the concept as such. The number and importance of experts grows at the complex, as the complexity of problems grows, which initiates the production of new knowledge. With that, the number of lay people increases Given the unavoidably selective acquisition of knowledge, everyone becomes an expert for a particular area and a layman for the entire rest. Both concepts, expert and expertise, are not statically defined but change their meanings depending on the problem at hand, the kind of knowledge involved and the representatives involved. The description of the status of expert happens in part through research, where it is an act of benevolent democratization. More importantly, it is enacted by the media. The proliferation of advice as a social function has permeate, permeated practically all sectors of society, from nutrition counseling and financial counseling to marriage counseling and many other forms of counseling. This leads to a third observation. The ever intensifying medialization accelerates the trivialization of the role of expert. The description of the role of expert in TV talk shows or media interviews is motivated by news value and draws much more public attention than that by science. The three observations suggest to limit the diagnosis of a crisis of expertise in the epistemic erosion of democratic policy politics to the direct confrontation of political appeal to scientific evidence or obvious facts, such as the number of spectators on the mall at Trump's inauguration. Although not a new phenomenon, the, inten the intentional spread of dis disinformation has increased dramatically via the digital platforms, but only a small part of that, of the population, only a small part of the population is really inaccessible to scientific advice. If one takes the resistance to vaccines during the pandemic as a test, it is only 11%, at least in Germany. But then again, the numbers vary considerably over the EU member states. Closer inspection shows that the acceptance of vaccination depends on the economic situation, increasing with higher income, education, age, gender, and health. This is not even counting the kinds of government measures to establish trust. Popper may have had this complexity of the situation in mind when he stated, and I quote him, we need much more research on the conditions, perhaps different for different issues 
or policy domains or countries that determine why a particular model comes into being, flourishes, decays, and is substituted by another one. End of quote. Thank you. Okay, and our, our third speaker is E. Summerson Carr. Professor Carr is an associate professor of anthropology and an associate professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy and Practice at the University of Chicago. She's the author of the book, Scripting Addiction, an Ethnography About Addiction Treatment Practices in the US, and of the forthcoming book, Working the Difference, Science, Spirit, and the Spread of Motivational Interviewing. And uh, Professor Carr's paper is called The Rhetorical Production of Democratic Inexpertise, The Case of Motivational Interviewing. Professor Carr. Uh-oh. Going the wrong way here. There we go. Well, um, first I wanna uh, thank Tom and Gil for uh, their perseverance and fortitude in uh, producing what I think will be a magnificent volume. And also thanks to uh, them for gathering us here today. I'm really happy to be here. Okay, going the right way. In June 1962, at the University of Minnesota Duluth, American psychologist B.F. Skinner appeared before a largely unsympathetic audience. It was a time when political questions were commonly couched in psychological terms, with many Americans viewing the Cold War as a battle between the safeguarding of individual freedom of thought and the active suppression of it. Skinner's radical behaviorism was widely associated with the latter tendency. His central thesis of operant conditioning, which he defined as the ongoing shaping of behavior relevant to its environmental sequelae, was seen as an attack on the cherished American ideal that individuals are authors of our own acts, whose participation in public life is relatively unmediated by external authorities. By way of the very same ideal, post-war Americans were also highly skeptical of experts, especially those who took human subjects as their expert objects. Accordingly, readers, uh, sorry, I'm gonna get this right here. Accordingly, readers chafed at the Ladies Home Journal article in which Skinner described the air crib he designed to assure optimal sleeping conditions for his daughter while minimizing his wife's maternal labor. Skinner's utopian novel, Walden II, in which he imagined a world in which punishment had no place and positive reinforcement reigned, was met with similar reactions. These experiments were cast not just as anti-democratic, but also, and by extension, as un-American as well. Indeed, a tellingly broad range of US political figures expressed outrage in Skinner's interest in designing environments to stimulate pro-social behavior. For instance, within months of uh, Noam Chomsky publishing a scathing review, which compared Skinner's behaviorist program to a well-run concentration camp, Spiro Agnew, issued a chilling warning that Skinner was intent to perform radical surgery on the American psyche. One of Skinner's most vociferous critics was Carl Rogers, the founder of client-centered therapy. Rogers staked his therapeutic program on the premise that clients will self-actualize as long as professionals abstain from overt evaluation, diagnosis, and direction. 
unconditional positive regard was the centerpiece of Rogers' influential approach to psychotherapy, with its central technology being reflective listening. An ostensibly passive uh, process of verbally echoing clients' statements. In public appearances, Rogers framed client-centered therapy as democracy writ small. The site of unfettered self-expression of clients, free from experts' authority, experts whose job was now to simply recognize rather than analyze. Rogers even once averred that the verbal material from centered client interviews comes closer to being a pure expression of attitude than has yet to be achieved by any other means. So when Rogers joined Skinner on that Minnesota stage in 1962, it was no surprise when he led with the bald assertion that the very survival of American democracy was at stake in the choice between his client-centered therapy and the radical behaviorism of his opponent. The exchange was recorded, packaged, and labeled as a dialogue, but played out as a blistering debate with Rogers relentlessly charging that clinical direction is political direction and behaviorism is totalitarianism if on a smaller scale. Skinner measuredly responded that the goal of any intervention from early education to adult psychotherapy is precisely to direct uh, and, and positively condition really to people to act responsibly. For Skinner, the pressing political question was not whether to direct, but how to do so in positive, non-punitive ways. Skinner also underscored that no intervention should have surreptitious elements. He further questioned just what his opponent might be hiding, suggesting that the most allegedly client-centered interventions have directive elements, whether the client or the professional uh, acknowledge that or not. Yet despite his many attempts, Skinner found himself unable to persuade the American public that rejected explicitly directive interventions while remaining critically immune to the less obviously directive elements of client-centered therapies and the third uh, wave therapies that would soon follow. So in the half century following this momentous debate, Many American psychotherapists have remained deeply divided between client-centered and directive approaches, if the lines between the two have rearticulated themselves in various ways. But if Rogers reasonably concluded that the basic difference between a behaviorist and humanistic approach to human beings is a philosophical choice, one flourishing American therapy called motivational interviewing, or simply MI, seized upon that very difference uh, as an opportunity for innovation, <clears throat> inviting those to practice it to be both client-centered and directive at one and the same time. So MI was uh, uh, first developed in the 1980s as an alternative method of treating problem drinker drinkers uh, 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 by American psychologists, uh, Christian spiritualists, and one of the world's most cited social scientists, William R. Miller. Since that time, MI, which calls itself a conversation style, has spread across professional fields, including primary care medicine, counseling psychology, social work, sanitation, corrections, and even dentistry. As I argue in my forthcoming book, the dissemination of MI across these varied fields has revivalist qualities. Uh, with some trainees so uh, transformed by MI's signature spirit that they themselves take up training MI as their vocation. At the same time, MI's designation as an evidence-based practice has paved the way for reimbursement by private and public insurers and accordingly fueled its widespread adoption as both a scientifically sound and cost-effective brand of expertise. Nevertheless, Miller explicitly disavows expertise and urges practitioners of his method to do the same. For instance, in MI's foundational textbook, Miller defines expertise as an anathema to the spirit of his method. 
He also frames expertise as a trap, ensnaring precisely because its most common uh, effect is to edge clients into a passive role, which is inconsistent with the basic goals of motivational interviewing. And just if readers somehow overlooked these warnings scattered throughout the text, the book's glossary of MI-specific terms includes the following entry. Over my uh, ethnographic engagement with the developers and disseminators of MI, I came to learn that the expert trap is not simply a warning against a clinical error as the glossary defines it, it's a familiar warning against political error as well. More specifically, MI proponents aspire the motivational interview to be a quintessentially democratic inter interaction, one that invites clients as equal party who feel free to choose and pursue their own ends. At the same time, the motivational interviewers are intent on directing the client towards specific normative, professionally supported behavioral goals, whether quitting smoking, sanitizing water, losing weight, or taking prescribed medications. MI training involves translating these ostensibly contradictory aims to invite client collaboration and to direct them into a recipe for professional action. Consider, for instance, the article, The Eight Stages of Learning Motivational Interviewing, Compulsory Reading, and Every uh, MI Training I Studied. In it, trainees learn that their first task is to develop an openness to collaboration with clients' own expertise. Soon thereafter, trainees are reminded that they should be consciously and strategically goal-directed while keeping the initial charge in mind. Achieving these paradoxical aims in a single interaction takes considerable rhetorical finesse. To be sure, explicitly warning apprentices against the expert trap is less than half the battle. Apprentices to MI must also master an inexpert register that projects professional uncertainty rather than authoritative knowledge while interacting with clients, all the while directing them to some behavioral end. With the case of MI in mind, I offer a glimpse into how uh, the central paradox, or at least a central paradox of American democracy and expertise alike, uh, that is uh, the direction of subjects understood to be self-governing is rhetorically managed and resolved. Uh, I first began uh, studying the dissemination of MI in 2009 following trainers, including Miller, around the United States, and at one point embedding myself in a year-long MI training at a large social service agency that I call U Haven. Through scores of role play exercises and under the watchful eye of their trainer, Kai, 12 American helping professionals tirelessly rehearsed the four speech acts that comprise the motivational interview. Open questions, reflections, affirmations, and summaries. The trainees learn that each of these speech acts come in many varieties and when properly placed in a professional exchange, elicit different client responses. Accordingly, they strive to fine tune not just what they said in the course of a real-time therapeutic exchange, but also how they might say it, controlling the tone of an affirmation so as to sound sincere rather than saccharine, um, punctuating reflections with unusually long pauses, and recharging banal client statements in relatively inspiring summaries. As MI textbook underscores and Kai often reminded, the goal of such techniques is to create the feeling and the effect that client interviewees have talked themselves into change. This was a seductive promise for 
uh, U Haven professionals who regularly found themselves in standoffs with clients, whether when working to convince an elderly schizophrenic man to take a much needed shower, urging an inveterate heroin user to save enough money for rent, or rallying residents of an assisted living uh, uh, facility to take the necessary steps to rid their quarters of bed bugs. Working in the harm reduction mode, these professionals felt they had very little leverage uh, in these loaded exchanges and were therefore primed to throw themselves into learning MI as a potent, if subtle, tool of intervention. Still, learning an inexpert register is not easy and requires reflexive attention along with ongoing supervised practice. Trainees squirmed when their affirmations sound canned and winced when they asked a closed question when they realized later they could uh, issue an open one. To help them along, Kai periodically screened video demonstrations of the method. One such film widely used in MI trainers stars William Miller himself, sitting in a small, dully lit room. The conversation begins when the client actor, who wears a blonde ponytail along with his business casual garb, curtly confirms that he has been sent to the room because he has recently failed a drug test administered by the company where he works long and hard, presumably as a middle manager. Miller immediately expresses sympathy. Using the colloquial expression, you got snagged to refer to the random company issued drug test. Miller adds, I would imagine you're pretty angry about that. This reflection elicits a long animated account from the ponytailed man who frames the drug test as a violation of his privacy, qualifies his drug use as strictly rec recreational and betrays irritation for having landed in such constrained therapeutic quarters. Nevertheless, Miller continues to respond in surprisingly sympathetic terms. He repeats or reflects the pony ponytailed man's uh, complaints about his company and his defenses of his drug use with little probing and no sign of disjuncture. As if in commiseration, Miller reflects, it happens in your private life really, and the company has no reason to be concerned about this. And it's none of their business, in a way. The ponytailed man nods along, surprisingly put at ease by his new agreeable companion. The ponytailed man now starts talking more and more, raising new topics at breakneck speed, the tedium uh, of work, the relaxation offered by smoking a little weed, the irritation of wives who complain about drinking with the boys. As Miller continues to affirm and reflect, something unexpected happens, at least from the perspective of the ponytailed man. Suddenly, he shares that he uses drugs far more regularly than he initially let on, that he uses not just marijuana, but also cocaine and even heroin, and that he is uncertain about how he would function without drugs, statements quite out of line with his initial account. His indignations at violations of his privacy and autonomy dissipate and transform into admission in in uh, admission of concern about his own behavior. And just as he had earlier in the conversation, Miller apparently agrees with everything the ponytail man just says, pausing as if to search for just the right words to reflect what he has heard. Almost imperceptibly, Miller layers new meanings into the ponytailed man's preceding statements. In these collaborative re-renderings, drugs are not signs of, of fun, freedom, autonomy, but index need, this dependency, escape from responsibility. Rather than defending his original position, the ponytailed man with no apparent anger or alarm nods along through this now deeply critical, if still sympathetically delivered recasting of his drug use. More importantly, 18 minutes into the 22 minute interview, the ponytailed man offers definitive signal of Miller's success, stating, 
my drug use has caused me a little internal conflict, I guess. This statement is an exemplar of what is known in MI as change talk. That is a client statement that animates professional and normative professional goals, even while it is experienced and, and as authored by the client themselves. A varying that people tend to believe what they hear themselves say, change talk is understood as having both elocutionary force, functioning like a promise or a contract, and perlocutionary force, indexing and precipitating future actions, like actually cutting down on drugs. So Ponytail John is a film favored by MI trainers precisely because Miller so elegantly demonstrates how clients can talk themselves into behavioral change and feel that they have done so without professional prodding. At UHaven, Kai used the film to sharpen trainees' understanding of reflections in particular, which is widely considered to be the most powerful of MI's central speech acts for stimulating change talk. He warned that whereas questions when posed by a professional can sound diagnostic, as if mining the client for data needed to come to expert conclusions, MI reflections as questions in rhetorical disguise elicit information and demonstrate interest while deflecting professional authority. Intriguingly, Kai further explained that the accuracy of reflection is neither necessary nor particularly desirable. In line with other experienced MI trainers, he elaborated that an inaccurate reflection projects the professional's current lack of knowledge, inviting clients to elaborate, equivocate, and revise, and therefore potentially seem to talk themselves into change, just as Miller does with Ponytail John. These rhetorical move maneuvers, of course, are for naught. Uh, if the client is keen to them, hence the significance of another uh, poetic feature, which I, I uh, can't get into in great detail, but these are the pauses, the unusually long and unconventionally placed pauses in uh, uh, the MI register, um, which function again to create the sense that the, the expert is unsure or the inexpert is unsure and is looking for just the right way uh, to uh, uh, understand the client. So in these ways and others, MI offers a telling resolution to the central problem of expertise in American democratic institutions, how to direct those who are construed as and feel themselves to be free. They do so by rhetorically masking rather than abolishing expert authority and disguising rather than avoiding uh, professional direction, alerting us to the possibility that democratic modalities, American democratic modalities, I should say, more generally, rely on subter subterfuge. Indeed, if Miller sees MI as a dyadic expression of American democracy, it may be precisely because, as he once put it, motivational interviewing is a kind of non-authoritarian way of moving in a particular direction where you, the professional, wants to go. With that and in closing, I want to briefly return to Skinner's uh, abiding concerns about the surreptitious control of behavior. It took well over 50 years for one of Roger's admirers to openly admit that the project of centering clients as equal collaborators and fulsome participants depends on the radically unequal distribution of knowledge about the terms and dynamics of engagement and craft and intervention accordingly. And if MI strikes some as uh, especially underhanded, we must reckon with the fact that those in MI training face the very same challenges as their democratic brethren, how to square the force of authoritative rhetoric with the demand that individual speech be free, how to exert influence without appearing to wield authority, and how to recognize others as equal actors and speakers without a de demonstrably inac uh, excuse me, equitable redistribution of knowledge and power. And while MI is first and foremost a therapeutic method and not a political program, it nevertheless reveals the modes of speaking and listening that are constitutive of, constitutive of what is a quintessentially American way of managing 
expert authority. Thanks. And finally, our discussant for this panel is Pamela Smith. Professor Smith is the Seth Lowe Professor of History. Is it Lowe or Lau? Seth Lowe Professor of History at Columbia and the director of the Center for Science and Society. Her most recent book is From Lived Experience to the Written Word, Reconstructing Practical Knowledge in Early Modern Europe. Now, I noticed there are four seats here. So I think after uh, Professor Smith concludes her remarks, maybe we could have the four panelists take those seats and then we can do Q&A. Professor Smith. Well, congratulations to Gil and Peter and Tom for this conference, and especially on establishing the Trust Collaboratory, which I hope will lead to um, much greater collaboration, of which I hope this invitation is the start. Um, I like very much your, um, your idea of advancing knowledge of the social dynamics of trust. I think that's a really great um, way that you first started it too. So I'm a historian of science, as Tom um, alluded to, and my own research is actually in craft knowledge of the pre-industrial period. Um, so I'll just begin by declaring my own lack of expertise in the present day um, so-called crisis of expertise and its relationship to democracy. So I learned much from the speakers in this panel, and my main sort of simpleton question for each of them could be phrased like this, but what are we talking about really? A question that actually seems to have underpinned the founding of the trust collaboratory as it moved from democracy to trust. Um, I loved Professor Carr's study of motivational interviewing and her upping the ante to relate it to American democracy um, uh, in her paraphrase, really to motivate in her paraphrase of B.F. Skinner's apt words, quote, the pressing political question of how to direct people's participation in public life in positive, non-punitive ways. The techniques reminded me of classroom teaching, how to gain the participation of 15 or so students of wildly different levels of expertise, interest, and attention in a non-directed and supposedly undetected way in order to elicit from the students themselves the salient points one wants them to take away from the classroom. As Carr points out, it's a virtuoso performance, like in the film with Ponytail John, of in-expert expert rhetoric. But there are so many confounding obstacles to this performance in the classroom, misinformation that the students might have gathered by Googling the subject of the readings at the last minute, the very acute analysis of a student that is lost to the class because she doesn't have the confidence to speak up, or the distraction of a student shopping on his computer instead of participating, and on and on. And of course, some of the students' own recognition of what's going on and their willingness or resistance to playing a role in that performance. So I come back to my simple, simple question, what are we talking about really? Is this dance performance between expertise and inexpertise a small case or dynamic of democracy? And you did make the point that this is about US democracy, but I wonder, this is a question, whether it can also extend to the German examples um, alluded to in Peter Weingart's paper, or is it about an ideal of democracy perhaps carried out, especially in the United States? Um, and can this case study be viewed, to use rhetorician's terms, as a synecdoche for democracy, a part that stands in for the whole, or is it simply a metaphor, a term that takes us to a new level, semantic level, for a thing, democracy, that's maybe not even a thing, but an ideal. And in this case, what are the specific characteristics of that ideal that the metaphor aims to highlight? Um, and I, it seems to me to be surreptitious control of behavior, um, which is very interesting, but I wonder if it has greater insight into other dynamics of democracy. In Harry Collins and Roger Evans' contribution, and I have to say I received a 40-page paper from Harry and nothing from Roger, so my, my comments really deal with, um, with Harry's paper. Um, 
but I would like to understand better how the two contributions actually relate to each other. Um, so uh, that might be one another additional question, having heard your contribution now, um, Professor Evans, um, to my comments. But, you know, in, in following uh, uh, Professor Collins's paper, uh, what are we talking about? I come back again to this question. What are we talking about when we talk about crisis and democracy? And most of all, about their use or his use of a term no less than truth and quintessential truth as an ideal of um, science. And uh, I veritocracy, I'd like to hear more about, but I um, I see that its root is veritas, and um, so it seems that we are talking about a regime of truth. Now, as a historian of science with an understanding of how the system of knowledge making that we call science today was proclaimed as a new active philosophy that would lead to um, certainty and demonstrated knowledge, in, in understanding how it was articulated and institutionalized in the 17th century, I have to protest that the undifferentiated ideal of truth as a stand-in for a much desired certainty of knowledge got us into all sorts of problems that we still see the results of today. If scientists and the entire funding structure of science still in some ways lives on this rhetoric of disinterested and value-free objectivity, continuous innovation, ever greater certainty and benefit to the public, and lay people truly believe in those superpowers, not understanding that amongst themselves, scientists have a much more nuanced understanding of their knowledge's various levels and capacities for certainty than public demonstrations of that lack of certainty, such as we saw play out in the various masking and distancing policies during the height of the pandemic, um, as scientific knowledge about the virus developed and changed rapidly, that kind of display of uncertainty can lead to disillusionment and belief. Thus, a uh, disbelief, sorry, can lead to disillusionment and disbelief. Um, thus, we need more, not less, science studies, I would say, of the second wave type. Um, and by that, I mean not, uh, uh, not what is understood. Um, so we need more science studies um, that examines the dynamics of scientific um, uh, certainty, um, scientific um, process, um, and more science literacy. And by that, I mean not what is generally understood under that label and which is taught in courses like Frontiers of Science at Columbia, um, but rather that is about the content of science, but rather, I mean, a pressing need to provide more education about the process of knowledge making of the entire enterprise that we call science today which would include, of course, case studies of rhetoric, analysis of hierarchies of knowledge, and the many distinctions between, as Gill has pointed out, general science and those scientific disciplines related to politics, regulatory science, and policy science, as well as the commercial involvement of many branches of science and the outright misinformation perpetrated in the name of science and expertise by corporate entities. We thus need to make science studies understanding of the process of science, what um, Professor Collins in his useful taxonomy of expertise in his book, Are We All Scientific Expertise now, uh, Experts Now, usefully labels ubiquitous expertise. And that's what I think we need is more science studies. Um, okay, so to Peter Weingart in his paper, um, I think that he really asks these pressing questions what constitutes the actual crisis? Is there actually a crisis here? And does it lie with science? As he acutely points out by quoting Alexander Bogdan, the wild protests of science deniers are a useful reminder that the real problems are not solved with scientific knowledge, and that is good for democracy. And especially I found his conclusions very apt, um, that is, Quote, if the populist anti-intellectualism and the rampant rejection of scientific expertise, if it exists, that is the rampant rejection, if it exists, 
whether it's a temporary phenomenon whose causes have to be seen in passing political developments or whether they constitute a fundamentally new relation between science and politics. From my own inexpert vantage point, but knowing the long history of the development of the knowledge making system of science, I have to answer this question by saying that that feared politicization of science that we hear in his paper was there at the very get go, that is that politicization of science, science and politics. However, the advent, however, I would also say that this particular moment now with the advent of the recent pandemic and climate change lying ahead of us or already with us, I think, I think that this moment opens up an opportunity um, uh, by which that relationship between science and lay people might change around the margins and by extension democracy. To conclude, I'll just say, um, I'll just focus for a minute on what I mean by that. We now know that the crisis of climate change has no scientific or technological fix, but instead probably lies um, largely in figuring out what moves people to new understandings and actions. And this social understanding um, uh, opens up a space for what might be called harm reduction, a term I would point out comes from public health, which is in some ways a kind of access point for uh, science and society. Um, so harm reduction. I think this can happen through what has been called community engagement, co-production of the sort that actually we see here, I think, um, of scientific knowledge that uses some of the methods of natural sciences in collaboration with the aims and methods of lay concerns, aspirations, and understandings of local specific problems or harms. Because modern science and the power dynamics of colonialism developed in concert, as in Francis Bacon's incredibly apt words, the advancement of the empire of knowledge in his Novum Organum, the new tool of the new philosophy, that intimately entwined with the advancement of European empire over land and resources and they continue to be inextricably intertwined today in ways far too complex to describe in the time left, but some of the dynamics that we can recognize. I'll just assert that it seems that we need first, perhaps in places of most harm, and I'll give you one example of that, as among the Pima, that is the indigenous members of the Gila River Indian Community Reservation in the American Southwest, whose extracted and digitized patient records made in the course of a longitudinal epidemiological study and circulated as the Pima Indian Diabetes da data set and subsequently used as the training data set for all kinds of big data models, including exploding manhole covers in New York City. And I'm drawing here from the wonderful study by Joanna Radin. So this data set was used without permission absolutely self-evidently without permission or benefit to the Gila River Indian community. So in those places like the Gila River Indian community of most harm, we, that is scientists, and I mean by that, not just natural scientists, but the ger in the German sense, Wissenschaftler and Wissenschaftlerinnen of all kinds, natural scientists, social scientists, historians, need to figure out how to engage in a collaborative means of building knowledge on a new model in which the enterprise of science learns and collaborates um, from, open, from a position of open-endedness, perhaps even humility, to local concerns and harms, such as, um, and there are many examples of this, I would just note, as I think someone did in their paper, um, the kind of uh, collaboration that occurred in the ACT UP citizen panels of the NIH. Um, so builds knowledge of limited certainty, what my early modern interlocutors would have called a kind of moral certainty that is certain enough to act on provisionally. Perhaps the demonstration that this is in fact possible in areas of most acute harm we can perhaps work towards a kind of harm reduction 
that would build greater trust at both ends of the collaboration spectrum among scientists of all sorts in order to trust lay knowledge and capacities and at the other end of the trust spectrum for the process of making knowledge of limited certainty, um, bringing about trust among lay people. Now, maybe this puts me in the postmodernist pit. I have the feeling it possibly does, um, but I would say so be it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll, I'll be happy to manage questions, um, but if we could have the speakers come up and, and sit at this table. Um, also, we should plan to extend this by maybe 10 minutes. Is that reasonable, Gil? Oh, right, right, okay. So we'll give the speakers each a chance to respond to those comments. Thank you. So I believe, um, well, if, does anyone wish to respond to Pamela Smith's comments? Oh, a couple of things, yes. sorry. Um, Sorry, can you? Um, so yeah, so those first apologies for not sending a paper. I was um, assuming that you would have read the, the handbook chapter, because if you had, I think you'd have found more common ground perhaps than you're expecting, because we do actually end the handbook chapter with uh, an argument for more civic and public education about the process of science being exactly what is needed. Um, so I think what I was trying to say, and apologies if it wasn't clear, was it's not that we need less science studies, but it's more an argument for expanding the scope and concerns of science studies to say that, yes, we absolutely need wave two kinds of science studies. And the whole point, you know, and, and we're absolutely clear, I hope, that everything we, we say and do should build on and be consistent with that. Um, what I was arguing for, I suppose, is an expansion of the concerns of science studies to include those other settings in which it's not so much the problem of legitimacy that is the is the thing, but to recognize that this problem of extension might also be a topic of concern for people in, in science studies. So I guess that's all I wanted to say in, in response to the to discussion. But I would like to know what veritocracy means. I didn't, yeah. Yeah, uh, so the structure of our talk was the following, that uh, Rob was essentially saying what was in the handbook chapter, and I was trying to use that as a license for saying, oh, and by the way, this is where we're going now, which is a little bit further along the line, I would say. And, uh, this second part has essentially been motivated by fear and horror. Um, fear, what was that? What's the title of that book? Fear and something in Las Vegas. Yeah. Fear and loathing, yes, of the Trump administration, um, which it seems to me has taken us back to roughly the same political situation that famous. Uh, Columbia academic Robert Merton was writing in. He was, of course, responding to what was happening uh, with the growth of fascism in Europe and the Second World War. And it seems to me that we're just about back in that same place now. And we STS academics have some duties to respond to it. And I'm trying, we're trying to write about what that would look like. And uh, Working from Hannah Arendt, who points out that uh, what fascists like is not people who are confirmed fascists, but people who don't know the difference between the true and the false. The notion of a veritocracy as a democracy which would turn on the truth, exactly opposed to the kind of 
populist democracy that Trump and Kellyanne Conway want to establish, which turns on the non-existence of truth, incidentally worked into an art by Putin uh, in Russia at the moment. Though of course, he has no ambitions to make it a democracy, but he seems to have decided that the lack of truth will certainly help him keep control of the country. So the idea is, the question we're asking is, how can we establish a veritocracy? I've seen some very slight signs of it happening in the UK, where uh, Johnson's craziness has led uh, Richie Sunak, of all people, to say, now I am going to govern, govern with integrity, as opposed to Johnson. And uh, that's actually led to him having to restrict certain of his behaviours. So it, it could just work. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. So how would you establish a veritocracy? And at the very beginning, you've got an epistemological problem. Where are you going to get truth from? If we live in a postmodernist world, there's nowhere to look for this truth. And we're just showing how you can get it from the institution of science in spite of the predations of wave two, of which most of us here have been either pioneers or at least very, very strongly involved. So Peter and Summerson, you each have a chance to respond as well, or you can elect not to. When you said that uh, you might get caught in, in uh, post uh, modernism and so be it. Uh, uh, yeah, I, well, I think what we're seeing, <clears throat> um, the uh, this idea about veritocracy uh, reminds me of it, uh, namely, what the first book I think that has been written about uh, uh, the was, I don't remember what it was called by by Helga Novotny and uh, um, uh, the anyway, so to speak, the 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 new the 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 the, the new type of science that, that we're now talking about. I think what we what we're observing in STS in a, in a sense is is a product of that. <clears throat> is that this the the secludedness of science as an institution uh, is being broken up ever since the at the latest this the the second world war the, the end of the second world war uh, and then you've described some of that um and uh if i for instance if i remember specifically looking at the german science system which is very conservative in many ways uh the german professor uh is, is, so to speak, the epitome of that. And that is now being broken up, but we're not there yet. Now, re reminding you of Kant's idea that truth is what, what he calls a regulative idea, a regula regulative idea, probably best uh, uh, translated. And yes, we're not achieving truth in the ideal and absolute sense but as an idea it has to it, it, or it, it it does so to speak guide social political action ever since it was uh, set to, to this world and um, the kinds of criticisms uh, are actually going sort of beyond the point, namely, uh, yes, there is no absolute truth, there is no absolute certainty, certainty. And yet, and democracies, in the sense that uh, uh, Roger and uh, uh, Harry pointed out, ha has to operate on the basis of this regulatory idea of truth. If that is given up, uh, then you would not have any arguments anymore. You wouldn't have a, you would not have the deliberative nature of democracy. Uh, and um, what we're observing uh, ever since, say, uh, the 
when, when Trump was elected, but it wasn't just Trump, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was Johnson, it was Cameron, it was uh, in, in Germany, it's the AFD, it's uh, in, in Turkey, it's uh, Erdogan, et cetera, et cetera. It, it could be interpreted uh, as a reaction to science becoming uh, an open institution in the sense that it diffuses into society. About half of about half of the population now in the in the uh, Western countries have a college, at least a college experience, if not a college degree. In other words, they have become, they have come into contact with scholarly thinking, i.e. with the regulatory idea of truth. And it's no surprise, uh, or shouldn't be any surprise, that this so breaking up of, of science as the closed institution that it used to be, and it, and, and coupled, by the way, with social status, scientists enjoyed a higher social status in relation to the rest of the population, simply because they had the advantage of better knowledge or of higher knowledge, etc. So we shouldn't be surprised that this is accompanied by all kinds of conflicts and uh, all kinds of uh, 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 allegations uh, that this is uh, wrong or, or undemocratic or whatever. So that's just so to be a very careful interpretation. Um, well, first, uh, Professor Smith, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, read and, and comment on our papers. Um, just a, a couple of thoughts uh, relative to um, your one of your questions, which is to what extent this is a uh, particularly, if not peculiarly, um, American uh, 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 case. Um, I mean, certainly, I think you know. I, I'm I'm quite moved by uh, Nancy Fraser's discussion of of paradigms of justice, paradigms of of democracy, which um, I think are shared to some degree. I do think that there's a particular focus on the ideal of autonomy. Um, in the United States, and it's the one that I think um, uh, motivational interviewing, as well as a lot of other American therapeutic uh, uh, traditions are particularly focused on. Miller, for example, just baldly says, you, you cannot tell other people what to do, or at least directly do that, um, explicitly do that. Um, and so uh, I think that relates to uh, particular, again, if not peculiar ways that Americans have to uh, manage expertise, which makes your analogy to the classroom setting particularly uh, interesting um, and sure familiar to many of us. Um, I mean, I think it's not not only, though, that we're de dealing with that ideal, but we're dealing with the tension that the motivational interviewers are. Um, which is on, on the one hand, a kind of behaviorist logic, um, and the other, a more kind of hermeneutic, analytic um, uh, focus on inner cause. So if we put ourselves back in the classroom for a moment, you know, there's the, the one set of explanations. Why are they doing that? What's wrong with them? You know, when did this particular way of being come about and look at how it's manifesting in this person and that person and so forth. Um, and a behaviorist one, which would always be asking, what am I doing or what's happening here that is causing the student to shop for their Nikes rather than, you know, pay attention to the lecture? What have I done? So one of the interesting things, which you know, this is this is not probably um, my interlocutor's favorite aspect of my um, uh, uh, ethnographic engagement with them, but one thing there is to be said for the behaviorist logic is that it does inspire a particular kind of reflexivity, right? Which is always sort of asking the question, "What am I doing that produces a particular effect?" 
Um, the fact that that has to be shrouded when it comes to um, being directive, right, is trying to get the client to stop doing X or start doing Y is, I think, particularly um, American. So let me just add as a general point that those watching on Zoom may submit questions, if, if not for this session, then the subsequent ones. But let's begin with a question from the audience. Uh, yeah, so this is a question, particularly for Harry Collins and Robert Evans, maybe also for Peter Weingart. And what if I were to say to you that having with the best of intentions contributed to the breakdown of scientific authority, what's going on now is a kind of academic equivalent to an act of repentance. Uh, and um, an effort to, well, maybe set the record straight, but also to change the record and to uh, uh, restore what is now under threat from a direction that perhaps you never expected. Thank you. I like your question. So uh, I, I really want to read your report on the, the fractal thing. Uh, was you, yeah? Fractal. Oh, sorry. I'm visually impaired, so I can't see. Uh, the fractal, I'm, I'm doing some other thing based on the idea of social capital, which I think is related to trust. But the question is about uh, why people do not trust experts, especially in the university setting. Uh, and it deals with producing knowledge and producing useful knowledge. Uh, universities are known for not having, they claim to have interdisciplinary research, but that doesn't really exist in universities. Uh, young professionals and young researchers are not incentivized to do interdisciplinary research. The tenor system is geared toward focusing on specific field. And if you look at complexity science and systems thinking, well, most of our human problems are very complex to be solved by one particular field or study. And I don't even know whether the idea of having a concept or expert is real. Maybe you can say I focus on one part of the system instead of saying I'm an expert. So what needs to be done to change that silo mentality? which does not encourage people to do research, interdisciplinary research. Thank you. Uh, I, okay, let me, let me start with your question about whether this is an act of repentance. Um, so the, certainly, I, I don't know whether people here know this, but I was one of the pioneers of wave two, uh, along with Robert here, and he came up with a concept called the experimenters regress which showed that it wasn't so simple to work out what's true and what's not true just from repeated experiments. And was in those, was very much involved in those very, very heady days of the early 1970s, uh, where we were uh, doing these detailed case studies of how science actually worked and showing that it was much more complicated than everybody thought. And that you, there was no, you know, that uh, in our phrase at the time, a scientific knowledge is a social construct. It's all triggered by Kuhn, really. Uh, and of course, he was triggered by Fleck and Bob beforehand, philosophers who used to be Wittgenstein quite a lot, um, and so on and so forth. And it was tremendously exciting. And of course, it all tied in with the two cultures debate discussed by C.P. Snow that had anybody coming out with a literature background felt that at last they could get a handle on the bloody scientists who had all this prestige and so on. And all that was very exciting. And then what made Rob and I write that 2002 paper, which turned away from that emphasis, uh, was noticing that some of our colleagues were taking this work to the conclusion that they sided with the parents who were against MMR vaccinating their children. And we thought, wait a minute, this is crazy. There's no way that what we've been doing ought to lead there. That's not what we intended, but it wasn't, it wasn't a repentance because we still thought that what we were doing 
was a correct description of how science worked. I mean, we'd actually done the field work. And it was disappointing that the group of people, philosophers and a few natural scientists who engaged in the science wars, which were attacks on us in an attempt to push everything backwards to wave one, just treated us as fools and idiots. When you know, it was laughable, they just didn't understand the science that they were talking about. Uh, and they had, there was an opportunity there actually for them to do something saying, hey, what these guys have found out by studying science very closely, that looks like it's true. How can we get back to some respect for science? And that's what we're trying to do with this wave three stuff. But it's not repentance, it's just, we never intended this to happen, yeah? And so it's, let's see how we can get back to, get back to the, make the policy implications more sensible and sane, but while not rejecting the actual findings that we came up with as a result of these intense and fascinating and incredibly exciting case studies of how science actually works. Is that, a, you see what I mean? Now, how can we make people more interdisciplinary? Well, it's an interdisciplinarity is an incredibly difficult thing because if you think about the fractal model, which we've got there, how do you get to be in one of those specialist groups? Well, you get to be in one of those specialist groups by spending a huge amount of time inside one of those specialist groups. So, I mean, in my case, in the gravitational wave study, I reckon it took me 10 years to learn to speak the language of gravitational wave detection physics. And then, you know, I was actually able to demonstrate this by, by doing rather well in imitation game tests. So we had a gravitational wave physicist ask me questions and another gravitational wave physicist answered the same questions. Uh, we, I, none of us knew what the questions were gonna be. They were technical questions. We put our answers, then the, the dialogues were sent to nine other gravitational wave physicists, seven of whom said they couldn't tell who was the real gravitational wave physicist and who was Harry Collins, they all knew me. And two of them said that I was the real gravitational wave physicist and the other one must be Harry Collins. Okay, so we passed this, this test, but that took about 10 years. So when you say interdisciplinarity, it's that kind of effort. And, and you know, at that point, I wasn't to the point where I could contribute to gravitational wave physics, but I could understand it. And that's the kind of efforts required. So there's quite a lot written about interdisciplinarity, its difficulties, how to partially accomplish it and so on. But you can't just do it by saying you should be more interdis interdisciplinary because the expertise is essentially a narrow business and it's an intense business. There's one question coming from the cyberspace. Uh, Xin Yan Wu has a question or comment as a follow-up on Professor Smith's address. Um, this audience asks, ADA played a role in ending the AIDS pandemic, but the medication was nonetheless still developed by scientists. So without the participation of lay experts, the crisis would have still been resolved, maybe slower. Um, the same thing arguably also happened during the COVID pandemic when the immediate danger was no longer threatening, trust in science kind of recovered. How then is the crisis of expertise or the decaying of trust in science fundamental and essential in our era? Um, thank you for that <laughs> question. I feel like maybe the um, the rest of the panel should actually be answering this. Um, uh, I think that the, I mean, from my perspective, I think that the, the involvement of ACT UP in um, the, the, you know, AIDS crisis was, um, was really central to having more attention paid to it. And that um, that wouldn't have happened whether it's fast or slow, I think the important thing is that it was very, very central in um, in in actually directing attention to it, as other kinds of activism has been for other kinds of um, 
uh, problems. So, um, you know, this is a question that one could answer in very um, detailed ways that I think we don't have time for. Um, but uh, maybe the maybe the panel also has a comment. I guess we have a brief moment if anyone would like to address that. Okay, so in any case, we're we're out of time. So we're going to first of all let's thank our five participants on this panel for the wonderful papers and comments. And we're going to adjourn briefly for a coffee break. So the theme of our second panel is objectivity and trust. And, you know, um, we did so well on time in the first one. We'll see how we do on this one because we have four speakers um, and four distinct talks. So I'm going to try to be, you know, efficient. Our first speaker is Andy Lakoff. Andy, you know, has a PhD in anthropology, is in the Department of Sociology, and has an appointment in communication as well. So he's a professor of sociology, anthropology, and communication in USC. Um, he um, <clears throat> he has done uh, uh, research, uh, he's conducted research in the United States, in France, in Argentina. His interests include uh, globalization processes, the history of the human sciences, social theory, and the risk society. Um, many of my students know Andy because of the book Pharmaceutical Reason, that was his first book, um, Knowledge and Value in Global Psychiatry, which looked at the circulation of medications, diagnosis, and pharmaceuticals um, in global health. Since then, he has done a lot of other things. Um, he has uh, published a couple of other books most uh, importantly, the, the one that he tells me he didn't actually think that the title is going to reflect anything. The title was Unprepared, and it was published, I think, in 19, sorry, 2018. Uh, yeah. Um, and two years later, we discovered that we were unprepared, and, and, uh, and um, uh, journalists were at Andy's door as, you know, you have predicted that, and he had to tell them, no, I did not predict that. Um, and then just very, very recently, so this is a plug for a very recent book um, that Andy published with Stephen Collier. It's called The Government of Emergency, Vital System Security, and the Birth of American Biopolitics. This is an absolutely fascinating and uh, really comprehensive story of the emergence of a new mode of government of disasters, catastrophes, and then normal disasters and normal catastrophes in the United States that takes us all the way back to the 1940s and 50s and brings us to today. So Andy, please, the floor is yours. Um, thanks, Gil, for the kind introduction. I think probably my multiple appointments are a sign of my attempt to evade being an expert uh, over the last couple of decades. Um, I first of all want to thank uh, Tom and Gil uh, for their work to put the volume together and also Christian for his coordination of the event. Let me see if I can figure out how to work this. So uh, my paper is not so much about the crisis of public trust in expert authority, but rather it's about how anxieties about this crisis can be used as a basis for defending the autonomy of experts. And I focus on a kind of experiment in the reconstruction of regulatory authority that took place during the first year of the coronavirus pandemic. I call this period a regulatory state of exception that was occasioned by the declaration of a public health emergency and that held the danger of eroding the authority of experts to make objective decisions based on standardized protocols. So let me begin in April 2020 when the Trump administration introduced Operation Warp Speed, an ambitious effort to speed up the development, production, and distribution of vaccines to address the pandemic emergency. The program contracted with several drug and biotech companies to support vaccine development with an initial $10 billion budget. 
And the time frame that it envisioned was audacious in comparison to the prior history of the introduction of novel vaccines, seeking to deliver 300 million doses of safe and effective vaccines by early 2021. While a typical vaccine development process could take more than six years to complete, Operation Warp Speed sought to reduce this timeline to one year through a series of efficiency measures, including an expedited regulatory evaluation process. This accelerated regulatory process was a critical element of the Warp Speed strategy. The normal review period for a candidate vaccine includes a detailed risk benefit analysis conducted by FDA scientists based on comprehensive evaluation of clinical trial data provided by the vaccine developer. From the perspective of the FDA, strict adherence to this standardized procedure generates a perception of objective judgment, ensuring public confidence in the integrity of the agency's evaluations. However, in the context of a deadly pandemic with no available pharmaceutical interventions, vaccine developers anticipated the need for an alternative to the normal regulatory process. The law governing FDA regulation provides for the use of a procedure called an emergency use authorization to allow the temporary use of an unapproved medical product in the event of a declared public health emergency, if available evidence indicates that it is reasonable to believe that the product in question may be effective in treating the condition identified by the emergency declaration. This procedure thus provides a flexible method for the rapid distribution of, dr of a drug or vaccine in the urgent circumstance of a state of emergency. At the same time, by attenuating the process used to generate a perception of objectivity, the issuance of such an authorization may be seen to compromise the integrity of a regulatory decision. The emergency use authorization process draws on a different policy framework than the normal procedure of drug regulation, that of emergency government. In contrast to the use of a risk benefit calculus to evaluate the potential treatment of a regularly occurring disease, the EUA is designed for an unpredictable but potentially catastrophic future outbreak. It was first introduced in the context of US bioterrorism preparedness initiatives in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Biodefense officials had assembled a strategic national stockpile of medical supplies as a means of anticipating a potential bioterrorist attack. And the stockpile contained troves of medical countermeasures such as smallpox and anthrax vaccines, nerve gas antidote uh, and antitoxins, many of which did not have FDA approval for these uses and indeed could not be ethically tested on humans since the diseases in question were not present in the population. National security officials worried about a future scenario such as a smallpox attack in which there would be an urgent need for mass treatment but not enough time for a prospective treatment to go through the regulatory approval process. Congress sought to address this gap in preparedness as part of the 2004 Project BioShield Act, which included a provision to expedite the use of a potentially life-saving countermeasure in the event of a mass casualty attack. This provision, the emergency use authorization, was first used the following year to enable the military to immunize soldiers against anthrax using an unapproved vaccine. In 2006, in response to the threat of a bird flu pandemic, New legislation extended this framework from bioweapons threats to emerging diseases such as pandemic influenza. The legislation provided the FDA with flexible criteria for assessing an emergency use application in order to allow for the exigencies of an as, as yet unknown future situation. Federal regulators would decide on a case-by-case -case basis what kind of evidence concerning safety and efficacy was needed and what method would be used to calculate the ratio of benefit to risk. For instance, a vaccine to be given to millions of healthy individuals would have to reach a different threshold in such an analysis than a potentially life-saving drug intended for an already infected patient. The EUA procedure thus established a space of regulatory ambiguity. It would be up for negotiation and contestation in this future scenario how an authorization for emergency use might be granted. 
in the case of Project Warp Speed, an unintended consequence of this interpretive leeway was the opening up of the regulatory process to what some observers considered dangerous external pressure. On February 4th, 2020, Health Secretary Alex Azar officially declared the spread of the novel coronavirus to be a public health emergency with, quote, significant potential to affect national security. And this declaration opened up the possibility of authorizing unapproved medical treatments under the authority of Project BioShield. Um, over the next several months, the FDA drew upon the EUA mechanism to allow the use of a number of still unapproved medical products. The issuance of an EUA for the use of hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19 in April proved controversial. Its use in COVID was still under investigation, but had been promoted as a wonder drug by a number of public figures, including the president. After several studies failed to demonstrate efficacy, its authorization with, was withdrawn in June. The procedure again sparked controversy in August when the FDA commissioner appeared at a press conference alongside President Trump to tout the success of convalescent plasma therapy in treating severe COVID cases and announced an EUA, EUA for its use. Soon after the announcement, several non-government scientists sharply criticized the FDA commissioner for making exaggerated claims about the treatment's efficacy. Even more troubling for many was the possibility that the Trump administration would use the EUA procedure to prematurely authorize the use of a COVID vaccine in advance of the upcoming election. Indeed, Trump campaign advisors described pre-election vaccine release as what they called the holy grail. This scenario became more plausible with the announcement by Pfizer's CEO that a conclusive readout of clinical trial results for its candidate vaccine would be available by the end of October, 2020, after which the company would immediately file an application for an emergency use authorization. In this context, a number of scientists questioned the integrity of the EUA process. The editor of Science published a scathing editorial assailing the, administration, the administration's health agencies for bowing to political pressure. Medline's editor called on the FDA commissioner to either pledge to conduct a rigorous vaccine assessment or immediately resign. From within government, a group of senior FDA officials also linked the credibility of the agency's regulatory decisions to its insulation from external interference. Biotech industry leaders joined the chorus of opposition to political meddling in regulatory decisions. So an alliance had formed among academic scientists, government regulators, and drug industry leaders to protect the vaccine authorization process from perceptions of external interference. The assumption was that the success of an eventual vaccination program would hinge not only on the therapeutic efficacy of a vaccine as demonstrated in clinical trials, but also on public confidence in the integrity of the regulatory enterprise. And here, the specter of vaccine hesitancy loomed. If a significant proportion of the population refused to take the vaccine due to distrust of the authorization process, a mass vaccination campaign might well fail to stem the pandemic. Now we should be cautious in interpreting the significance of these measures of public trust in a potential vaccine. Trust in regulatory science, as Gill has argued, is not best understood as an attitude that can be measured by surveys, but should be seen as situational a moving target shifting with the winds and dependent on when and how a question is, is posed. For my purposes here, the question is not so much whether these surveys accurately measured a coherent entity public trust, but rather how such measures of declining trust were marshaled as a resource by scientists and public officials who sought to insulate the FDA from political pressure. Under these circumstances, the prospect of vaccine hesitancy changed its normative valence. Rather than being a problem of irrational fear sparked by rumor and disinformation, a deficit requiring correction, evidence of public distrust signaled the danger posed by political interference into expert judgment. In September, Pfizer and Moderna announced that preliminary results from their clinical trials might be available as, as soon as the following month and the companies requested guidance 
from the FDA on how the agency planned to make a decision on whether to grant emergency authorization use status. Meanwhile, a bureaucratic struggle was underway between FDA career scientists on the one hand and White House officials on the other over how, candidate, how vaccine candidates would be assessed as the results of phase three trials came in. The FDA commissioner, stung by the criticism of the EUA process by his scientific colleagues, insisted that the agency would use stringent criteria for authorization and would subject all vaccine candidates to assessment by an external body of experts. FDA staff drew up a set of proposed guidelines for risk benefit analysis with the explicit goal of increasing trust in vaccines through the demonstration of an objective process of evaluation. Sorry, I can't read. <laughs> okay, I'm good. Don't have my glasses on. Um, the proposed guidelines indicated that clinical trial subjects would have to be tracked for at least two months for possible adverse reactions, and that a minimum number of severe COVID cases would have to be included in the control group. It was not lost on the White House that the adoption of these technical procedures would extend the timeline for any emergency use authorization beyond the date of the election. In early October, it was reported that the White House would likely blocked, block the proposed guidelines. At this moment of intensifying struggle within the executive branch, a number of external authorities weighed in to support FDA autonomy in determining evaluation procedures, again invoking the need to secure public trust and regulatory authority. At this stage, with the high stakes meetings of the agency's external advisory committee scheduled shortly to discuss the review process, FDA officials performed what an editorial in science later called bureaucratic jujitsu. They stealthily inserted the, the new guidelines into briefing materials that were posted online for, for participants in advance of the advisory committee meeting. As it turned out, the White House did not block the proposed guidelines, perhaps because they were now publicly available. And it would now be practically impossible for any of the vaccine candidates to receive authorization before the election. The New York Times called the appearance of the guidelines a win for career civil servants, while President Trump dismissed the outcome as, quote, another political hit job, making it more difficult for them to speed up vaccines for approval before election day, end quote. In the end, the construct of public trust and the specter of vaccine hesitancy wielded by an alliance of academic scientists, industry leaders, and government regulators enabled the FDA to fend off external interference and sustain the perceived integrity of the vaccine authorization process, at least for a certain audience. What occasioned this political and epistemological struggle was the distinctive bureaucratic space in which the evaluation of COVID vaccine candidates took place. In response to the pandemic emergency, the federal government had fostered a space of regulatory exception in which the EUA was a device that enabled vaccine developers to curtail the normal approval process. The device had been put in place 15 years earlier with a specific scenario in mind in which there would be no time to perform a normal evaluation of the safety and efficacy of a countermeasure to address a public health emergency. So the structure of a future crisis situation had been envisioned in advance what hadn't been envisioned was the potential for abuse of the procedure. In this context, regulatory agencies and medical experts sought to fend off external interference by invoking the need to preserve public trust as a way to assure the efficacy of a mass vaccination campaign. While this alliance was effective in staving off an October vaccine surprise, it did not in the end manage to depoliticize the question of vaccine safety and efficacy. Only now the task for authorities was once again to try to reassure the, those in doubt that there was no objective basis for distrust of expertise. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Ted Porter, distinguished uh, professor of history at UCLA. Um, he's best known for uh, trust in numbers, the pursuit of objectivity in uh, public in science and in public life. Um, 
if it's up to me, this book is read here religiously every year. Um, I sign it in my seminar every year. Um, this book has been translated to um, Japanese and French, maybe other languages, I don't know, and has been reissued, sorry, Korean as well. Um, he's also, however, the author and editor of at least five other uh, books, uh, that, and I probably don't have it right, but the most recent being Genetics in the Madhouse, The Unknown History of Human Heredity by Princeton University Press in 2018, and is currently working on another book provisionally titled Funny Numbers, yeah, okay, um, which will be about the contradictions of quantification in the intersection of science, business, and government. Now, the paper he wrote for the handbook was written together with uh, Wendy Esplanade um, from Northwestern, but she couldn't um, join us um, today. And Ted will speak about some unintended consequences of quantification, a very appropriate title for Columbia University where Merton's ghost still haunts the halls. I, I assume somebody is um, is going to be warning me of the, of the time limits. Good. Yeah. Okay. So um, I am um, um, uh, glad to actually have this uh, invocation of Merton. And I was I, I was I, I was thinking really the this department in particular at uh, at uh, Columbia, which um, I take to stand for, and I maybe maybe I'll be corrected, but uh, as uh, uh, as a as a the um, Oh, uh, the understand the confidence of uh, of science of an earlier era, and and uh, and of social science when uh, many of the things that we are discussing now uh, were not on the agenda. In fact, didn't seem didn't seem necessary. Maybe that's not maybe not that's not valid. But I take the uh, you know our current situation is reflecting a bit of uh, loss of I mean a loss of confidence and a bit of uh, of uh, you know reframing that that reflects the pressures of of modern times, and I actually I think particular our um, uh, our paper is about uh, data, and um, in uh, recent times uh, the data has become I think everybody's favorite word actually the favorite word of scientists even for the validity of the science they do which I consider okay so I mean that is to say they say data driven now. And is that a bold um, is that a bold defense of science? Uh, it seems to me a retreat from higher higher ambitions, reflecting. Well, I'm going to just say this, and I hope that, uh, as a kind of a, a, a uh, you know a possibility for, for first of all, I mean again a kind of retreat from stronger claims for what science might might what kind of knowledge science might uh, want to take data driven, uh, one which also um, uh, kind of removes even more than usual, removes the scientists themselves from the discourse. That is, it's something, it's another thing, it's data, it's not the, okay, and then uh, actually I wonder if there's a little bit of um, that, uh, that the uh, financial, economic, uh, you know, significance of data in our world is also, because also become part of this favorite, uh, you know, articulation of the of the values of Science. So I, I, I'll be interested if people, uh, you know, raise issues or uh, ask questions about uh, about th this uh, possibility. Um, as um, our uh, our book is is, or I mean, our contribution to this book is about uh, about data in uh, uh, various forms. And I just thought I would uh, run through the three main chief elements that we talk about, but they all are about. Um, I mean, none none of them are you know are are, are you know, critical of or are, are you know denouncing uh, data, but they are playing with data in interesting ways. So uh, we are uh, so our we have uh, three um, uh, little little topics within the within our our our, uh, uh, our paper, and the first one actually is something I got from this book on uh, genetics in the madhouse, a um a a, a German uh, mid 19th century, well, um, um, medical, a doctor of psychiatry, we would say, but the word psychiatry was barely used then. Um, a, um, a, a, a one for curing uh, the, or uh, candidates for, for curing uh, insanity. Um, 
And uh, um, uh, this, so this guy, whose name is Hagen, and who worked in, in, in northern Bavaria, uh, where he directed a, a, a mental institution for a lot of years. And um, he confronted a proposal, actually, which was in some sense quite quite popular among the uh, among the, uh, the the you know the mental doctors, the psychiatrists, um, the alienists. Is, I guess is the, is the word that was still used in English and French uh, about uh, about um, um, you know how to confront the horrible um, uh, you know, experience of their own. Um, uh, mental, um, you know, institutions uh, that from the late 18th century or early 19th century, when these institutions, there were a few of them and they were very small, grew up into like whole industries. So that, um, you know, by this time already, they, 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 you know, uh, they had all these, uh, their, um, their institutions, which they were supposed to relieve or even, uh, you know, um, eliminate uh, mental illness. Instead, the numbers of, of the insane just went up and up and went through the roof. And that continued actually until, you know, until um, uh, uh, medicine finally kind of gave up on curing and, or on, or on, uh, on uh, um, you know, re genuinely reducing mental illness in the 1940s. But um, um, so um, anyhow, but the one, so how, what do we do about this terrible problem? And actually these were definitely pioneering data institutions. They had, um, um, uh, you know, in the hospitals, uh, um, um, you know, grew and grew and grew. Their purpose was to relieve insanity. Um, I mean, patients were discharged and patients came back, but the effect was always, it was perpetual uh, growth. Um, and one uh, widely, I mean, these were data scientists, you know, avant la lettre or something. They were deeply committed to uh, to using data to try to find out what the real problem was, why, what, why they're, you know, their um, their fine institutions and all the all the developments that, that they had produced at the at these institutions, why they weren't working. Um, which so and the. Um, um, in the, in the in in uh, the uh, about 1860, there was a great project uh, emanating from France to bring all the data from all the you know all the different institutions in every country. Every country meant Europe and possibly North America, really here. But I mean that because that that's because that that was what might possibly be available to them, and to uh, with that data at last to you know acquire the knowledge that would allow them to determine what was working and what. And what wasn't, and um, this guy Hagen, who was a who was a, you know, directed an institution himself, as I say, um, after was sent the Bavarian government sent him a um, a uh, uh, you know a, a an appeal to to ask to ask him to comment on these uh, on the proposal of the French standardization and the new statistics. And Hagen tells us, I'm not sure if it was entirely ingenuous here, but anyhow, he was sympathetic at first. And then he began thinking about it. And he thought, um, you know, if they're going to bring you all these data oh, pretty soon, um, um, they are going to, uh, 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 they're going to have find, you know, they'll be comparing the results from different institutions, which in fact are heterogeneous. And they're going to, dream, you know, to, bring up all kinds of spurious uh, uh, results that reflect not the uh, causes of insanity, but something about the peculiarities of all these different institutions and the nature of the populations and where they draw them and so on. And so on. that is that it's going to put me, it's going to produce a lot of bogus results. Um, um, and that the real way to, uh, to proceed with this, he had quite humble or quite modest expectations for what could be achieved that the real way to go about this was to um, to take seriously the detailed information about the about the uh, the doctors and the pa patient populations who came into these institutions so to um, that the, a grand a huge data project would lead to misleading results and that closely so he's defending you know this the sanctity of his institution and that the the, the institute a close uh, um, 
study of what was going on at the particular institutions was the best way to get useful knowledge about, uh, first of all, about that institution, and then indirectly about uh, how, to how to deal with other patients. So it was a kind of a defense of medical uh, expert expertise or something over over data analysis. And uh, I mean, I, again, I love the um, uh, this um, you know kind of recognition uh, that uh, that a huge data project would lead to inevitably to spurious results because the populations were not the same um, and couldn't be made the same by any and and all the efforts to standardize would tend to lead away from rather than toward an understanding. Of the situation, so then you know that's that, that's our that's the first little study um, we have in this paper. The second one, uh, which uh, is um, about schools, again another what became a great data project. This uh, this in, in the this and the next are, are about the United States and in the um, this uh, the U.S. story here um, is about well um, you know the triumph, the gradual penetration, and uh, you know an, an increasingly important role of uh, of of standardized examination results in the assessment of schools. And we, at least in the United States, um, know this as uh, you know as a um, a, um, a discourse that produced you know a crisis as we as as which I think has never gone away of the about the. You know the failures of American schools assessed by what exactly by um, by results in standardized testing. So standardized testing, um, um, you know, provided the um, the um, uh, the basis for a uh, a sense that not just that well that that that, that the schools themselves were failing, um, and. Um, uh, so we think a little bit about, you know, again, this is a, a great a, a conclusion from data, and it actually um, reflects the paradoxes of, I think, the U.S. education in particular, though I won't say there's nothing like this anywhere else, in which um, uh, a highly unstandardized curriculum in the United States made it impossible to judge uh, achievement in schools. And all the, all the data, or, all, you know, the, the principal data, the most commented on data, um, that um, um, that uh, were used in these discussions are actually um, they were explicitly separate, distinct from the actual the actual curriculum. So the schools were to be judged by um, results not from what they taught, but for some but for some different kind of of, of goal which was independent of the of the curriculum. And I think that's rather. Unusual, and it put the teachers, of course, in a you know difficult position that they would be judged, or their their work would be judged by um, by the outcome of uh, of uh, tests on topics that they didn't teach. Well, actually, so then inevitably it became there was more and more pressure to move the curriculum toward what the standardized tests thought. The standardized tests were actually um, derived broadly this idea, the idea, the ideal of the. Uh, of the, this kind of testing was more like the I, IQ testing than it that was testing some kind of mental ability rather than actual actual learning. And so the um, um, you know the great data project of assessing schools is uh, you know was um, you know anchored in a, in in a switch away from testing the schools to testing what could actually be treated in a standardized way, which was uh, not the curriculum but some but some but some other things. So. And uh, the, the and the, the third of our little uh, studies, which is comes from Wendy Estelon's book on this topic, was about um, okay. I want just want to say um, these are kind of, of processes of evaluation that produce outcomes kind of through their own momentum rather than uh, rather than through you know conscious decisions about how best to do things. And the um, and the um, the the testing of um, or of or the evaluation of law students, which is the topic that 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 uh, she she has a book on, and or she has a, she's co-author of a book on, and and then uh, what, what had she um um you know uh, developed it in this in in, in, our, in this the, the third part of this paper it was about the her assessment of this, of uh, um 
of tests in of, uh, law schools. And um, and again, the story is in a nutshell. Perhaps some of you have seen this book, but the story, in a nutshell, is of um, of uh, you know a, a, a large body of uh, criteria which drove the law schools who before that had had, had their, certainly had their own sense of what was appropriate for uh, for uh, for schools or for for law schools or for a law school education, which also allowed for quite different populations, both in terms of the the level of um, academic preparation that, that brought the students into into them into these schools, but also actually different kinds of, practice, of ways of practicing law that they might be specializing in or trying to to, uh, to provide uh, lawyering for different kinds of populations. And all this was flattened out or was it was to be eliminated and everybody was to be judged on a single scale. And it drove the, I mean, the, um, the law school deans and their allies, you know, um, you know, were contemptuous of this at first, and found, you know, eventually that they couldn't resist it. In fact, though, I mean, the the, the uh, you know, the, the last few years have produced a little a result, starting with the most elite law schools, the one the ones that could afford to take, you know, to um uh, to refuse to be evaluated in this way. And actually, I don't know how this is how this is, has come out in it. I'm a little embarrassed that it only have finally thought today I could probably go find out. Maybe somebody, maybe somebody knows that, but but um, it, it was uh, again a um, you know kind of an amazing. Um, um, I mean, each of these this this is the most you know the, um, dramatic of all of these um, under of this undermining of uh, of uh, expertise that. Uh, law schools in the end couldn't defend their practices. That is, they couldn't not, they were contemptuous of this kind of testing uh, and they couldn't avoid um, accepting many of the results in order to get themselves up from the 47th to the 45th place in the ranking of law schools or whatever. So uh, you know, here, uh, one more episode in which a kind of ideal of, uh, of data is actually undermining expertise and that's, um, uh, is 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 this a you know a different I mean in some ways a different ideal of expertise but in uh, at least some of these cases you know brought on by pressures that uh, you know the uh, the experts the, the uh, those who who consider themselves to be experts and we don't necessarily want to disagree with them on this though be that as it may were um, you know, subdued in a way by the by the ideal of data so you know. Data. I love data as much as anybody, and yet uh, um, it, uh, you know, re, you know, re, it requires a light touch and an ability to deal with nuance, and uh, that's not easy to do any on a large scale. Maybe not always on a small scale. So, um, uh, anyhow, our 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 story is of data, and it's uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, the, the uh, astonishing ironies and uh, and uh, you know the outcomes uh, that were not what was wanted that often have come to prevail in the data world and uh, I think that's uh, the the topic of the problems of data I mean uh, and uh, uh, the ways in which they can even you know in a sense. Good, good data can be misleading when not allowed, when not uh, interpreted, and not subject to a kind of uh, a kind of expert assessment, um, is a continuing problem uh, in our times. And uh, so we are trying to uh, trying to kind of unpack what the, what the data world means in, in in our day. So thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Turner. He is a distinguished university professor at the University of South Florida. He is the author of more books than I can count on the history and philosophy of social science and statistics, including books on Max Weber. And he also edited the Cambridge Companion volume to Max Weber. He is a co-author of the standard one volume history of American sociology, The Impossible Science. Um, and, and also updated um, recently. He also written extensively in science studies, especially on patronage and uh, politics and economics of science and on the concepts of practices, including three books, the social theory of practices, 
brains, practices, and relativism, and a new collection of essays, understanding the tacit. Um, another book, Liberal Democracy 3.0, uh, civil society in an age of experts reflects his interest in the problem that we are dealing with here today, and as well as a collection of essays on this topic uh, titled The Politics of Expertise. Um, floor is yours, Sid. There's a great Durkheimian moment in all of this technology. So uh, look. It works. That's miraculous. Okay, since since we're starting out with uh, uh, confessions and repentance, uh, I want to issue a non-repentance here. Uh, I was uh, not involved in the science wars. I was an early critic of uh, the Strong Program and a late critic of the Strong Program. So I never got involved in any of that because I was doing it from the uh, sort of the philosophical side, which is how I got into this in the first place. And this particular problem of trust is actually more or less how I got into uh, science studies in the first place. I did a few articles critical of uh, Merton's uh, uh, justification of stratification in science in the 70s and then started in on, uh, by accident, I was appointed to a science studies unit as a visiting professor. And I thought, maybe I better learn something here. And so knowing something about organizations, I decided, well, I'm not going to hang out with scientists for 10 years, like Harry, great job, but I wasn't going to do it. Uh, I did hang out a little bit with phys physical oceanographers, which is totally different than what these people talk about here. And uh, instead, I looked at the history of uh, uh, funding, and I never really, I never really started writing past my big case, which was the uh, John Wesley Powell and the US Geological Survey and how it emerged out of the state geological surveys, which was a, a truly an education. And it actually uh, says a lot about this problem of trust in science because these people were really good at dealing with the public. Uh, John Wesley Powell, as head of the largest uh, scientific organization in the world, personally responded to people who sent in rocks and asked what they were. Uh, that's a lot more impressive than what was in the new stat report today where uh, they've reported that they've spent a billion dollars on long COVID research and no one can figure out who's making the decisions, where the money went, and so on. So that's not transparency, but uh, um, Powell achieved that. Okay, so the case I'm talk I want to talk about today is when you all know something about, oops, I go the wrong direction here. Uh, and it, it's a case of expert failure. So uh, the great thing about expert failure is it's very difficult to get access to information about uh, experts and how they think about their their failures. Uh, I was on a dissertation committee that was looking at the previous SARS epidemic. They got access to the CDC. Uh, uh, people told them stuff, but they were very evasive and uh, uh, not very forthcoming, which is characteristic of this stuff. But uh, we do have a lot of these reports that actually did have some access, although limited in, in every case. Uh, and we can sort of rethink some of these errors in terms of uh, the organizational side, and uh, uh, particularly about whether a particular system of generating expert knowledge is a good one and what its weak spots are. Um, so it's, uh, it's like tr stress testing a bank. Can we do that with expert uh, systems and say, okay, what's wrong with them? Um, so the way I think of this is, uh, this is kind of boring social epistemology, but a lot of, uh, of social epistemology ideas have to do with the idea that people come in with biases, that they are, there are ways of, of having them correct one another's biases. So even by uh, guessing on a number of beans in the county fair, you get a more accurate uh, uh, estimate than an individual's estimate. 
And you can also think of other systems like voting, delivered democracy, and so on, and in science itself as a, a system of taking biased uh, um, estimates and turning them into a collectively uh, correct uh, or a collective estimate, which may or may not be correct. So that's where the problem is. Uh, um, it's another system that's like a set of heuristics that has its own biases. So we can look at those biases a little bit. And, um, oops. Um, so what happens in uh, um, some of these cases? Well, the case I looked at was, was the uh, fairly well-documented one of the uh, 2008 and then the Greek financial crisis where the IMF went in and basically in the first case failed to anticipate the problem and the second case made it worse. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting structure um, and it, actually a very typical uh, expert structure where you have two separate systems, one of which corrects the other. So here he's talking about checks and balances. This is a way, this is, you can think of uh, the science system itself working this way. The first one is the grant system, then the publication system. They're two uh, quite different, but uh, both in, uh, based on peer review in this case. Um, uh, um, but in this case, it was di uh, different because it, uh, IMF had country experts and had a, a, a panel of stakeholders who were also experts. They were all finance ministers or representatives, and they all had specialized knowledge of their own banking system. So there's also a lot of secrecy here uh, that is characteristic of uh, uh, bureaucracies. Okay, so what happened? Uh, the... Um, they made a major mistake, and the report listed some of the features that contributed to it. This was sort of the intellectual side, but then it looked also at the organizational side. Um, there was very little communication between country experts. Uh, they were siloed, and there was a reason for that, which is uh, somebody could actually go trade on that knowledge. So banking secrecy is pretty important. Uh, and um, then, but in general, um, what we need to want to think of this in terms of is saying, well, all systems have uh, what I'm calling epistemic risk, uh, a risk of error and uh, um, what we, if we're thinking of this as a matter of organizational design, we want to design an organization that minimizes those risks. Uh, and um, building in uh, different kinds of biases or uh, um, counteracting biasing uh, uh, measures is one way of, of doing it. My favorite is. Uh, the, the one that James Brian Conant proposed in uh, the 50s, where he said, look, uh, scientists are prone to groupthink, they're prone to hobby horses, therefore you need a corrective. And he, he wanted a devil's advocate for every major technological decision who was also competent so that people could say, hey, uh, this is probably not a good idea. Um, so this is, a feature of all uh, organizations. Um, they work pretty well under normal circumstances, then something happens that they're not equipped to handle. And uh, so th their very virtues are the cause of their uh, problem, they're intrinsic. And in this case, the problem was they needed to agree on a policy in a relatively short time in order to make uh, uh, decisions, especially in the face of uh, a crisis. So um, they couldn't, they, they didn't like a lot of debate and they didn't like uh, a lot of dissenters. What they really liked was everybody lining up and agreeing that this was the uh, solution. Uh, and that was, um, and it was also that it was not 
independent of uh, the stakeholders. Now, that's not too surprising given that the stakeholders are the ones putting up the money for it. And uh, they uh, were people who the, the board um, knew plenty. And their idea was that uh, um, uh, they would take the research reports of the, the, the state or, or the, the national um, uh, economic experts the case experts and correct them uh, in terms of their own knowledge. So this is a checks and balance kind of thing. And um, the uh, people in the silos, the people who were the country experts um, knew this was gonna happen. They knew their decisions weren't gonna be approved yeah, without it. And um, so they they tailored the reports to those things. So contrarians weren't welcome, and nobody who uh, opposed what the major stakeholders uh, um, wanted were were welcome. Okay, so uh, paralysis was the thing that they were most afraid of, and uh, po policy action was what they wanted. So this is just a design feature. This isn't uh, anything intrinsic. And the board uh, didn't like their lack of control. And what they wanted was a more command and control kind of uh, uh, system. And uh, they um, that would have actually probably made things worse. Um, but one of the big problems there was connecting the dots. There are crises in various places. They could have been connected. Uh, the dots could have been connected. They weren't, each was treated as a kind of separate uh, problem. Um, but after all, the, the uh, protection of the researchers at the bottom was also a design feature. You don't want uh, the major players to dictate what people are going to say. Okay, so can we get any general lessons out of this? Uh, what I I think the general lesson is it's hard to design a, a expert system that doesn't have some uh, epistemic risk built into it. Um, the every time you correct for something, you introduce a new set of biases and people respond to those biases, so the bias problem doesn't uh, go away. Uh, stakeholders ought to cancel each other out. Uh, they don't always. Sometimes they end up with the same uh, biases, and that's the case I looked at years ago in terms of the uh, Hamburg cholera epidemic, which was a stakeholder uh, set of decisions, and they just made the wrong decisions, got the wrong expert, and that they believed in, and uh, uh, it was the worst cholera epidemic in Europe. So that's life. Uh, it's, it's hard to design uh, organizations to produce uh, expertise without failures, and uh, there's no general <laughs> solution to this problem. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, our fourth speaker is Bryce Laurent. Um, he's a professor of uh, sociology and science studies at Sciences Po and a researcher at uh, CSI, the Center de Sociologie de l'Innovation. Um, his research focuses on the relationship uh, between innovation and democracy and uses the theoretical approaches um, and empirical methods of science and technology studies. His public published books on emerging technologies and the democratic issues that they raise, a book on democratic experiments, problematizing nanotechnology and democracy in Europe and the United States, um, which was published by MIT Press in 2017, and a book on the politics of regulation, labeling the economy, quality and value in contemporary mar uh, markets, and European objects, the troubled dreams of harmonization, recently published to think about a year ago by MIT Press again. 
um, Bryce Laurent uh, current work is on the political dimensions of technological projects, such as um, city experiments and natural resources, and he's going to speak about public expertise in times of constitutional fragility. Thank you. Thank you, Gil, for the kind introduction, and thank you for organizing these workshops. So we'll have to figure out how to work the, uh, the slides. There should be a remote somewhere, right? <laughs> so someone someone left with the uh, voice. Oh, oh, yeah, it's here. It's black on black. That's me. That's you. That's me. All right. <laughs> All right. So as Gil said, I'm a professor at Lune Paris. I'm also at, I also have a gig at ANSES. It's a French uh, expertise agency where I'm the head of the uh, social sciences department. Um, well, the, the starting point uh, for this talk is, um, I mean, it's the topic of the workshop, right? It's the mistrust uh, in expertise and the relationship with democracy. And this is a quote uh, I found when preparing for the uh, the speech, and there are many of those quotes circulating. The, the theory here is basically that mistrust in expertise is a threat to social order because this information will circulate and because there is not only a pandemic, but also an infodemic as the head of the... Um, WHO uh, said in this um, in this quote, but of course there is another word, uh, voice in, in in the in the discourse about the relationship between expertise and democracy. And there's also the idea that expertise itself is opposed to politics uh, in contexts such as climate change, for instance. So in France, we have an interesting example. It's this guy called Jean-Marc Jancovici. Um, he was very active in developing carbon accounting uh, methodology. Uh, he's extremely prominent in the, uh, in the public debate in France about climate change. And his position is basically that expertise is opposed to democracy. That if you are to follow the numbers, then we can solve climate change related issues. But what uh, stands in the way is the irrationality of politics, right? Of course, this is extremely, I mean, this is politically charged, right? This is a particular vision of what democracy and expertise, of how democracy and expertise relate to each other. And this is not uniformly accepted. So this is, oops, sorry, is this one? This is another uh, uh, illustration of how the contribution of Jean Covici in the French public debate is um, debated about. So this is a very critical piece, seeing uh, Jean Covici as a reactionary polytechnician. And this is not, uh, this is not a, a, a detail. A polytechnician means that this guy is a graduate from Ecole Polytechnique, which has been the main uh, training uh, school for producing the um, the, uh, the the French elite, uh, so to so to speak. So this this example uh, shows that uh, in our diagnosis, ex expertise here can be opposed to populism, but maybe to uh, democracy itself by people such as uh, Jean Covici. But this example also um, tells us that maybe. Uh, what is interesting to, uh, to, to, to talk about is um, trying to understand the, the, the situatedness of the debate about expertise. And by situatedness, I mean the situatedness in particular, constitutional um, uh, configurations. And, and speaking of constitutionals, I mean, you know, both the ways in which problems are defined, problems are constituted, for instance, saying that the problem of climate change is about producing numbers through carbon accounting, right? But also constitutional, almost in the sense of legal theory, trying to define the, um, the channels through which public representation is produced and this decision-making is, uh, is organized. So the, the perspective I want, I want to, to follow in this talk and in, the, uh, in my chapter in the handbook is to try to, to go from a diagnosis about knowledge about the diffusion of knowledge, about the uh, possibility for certain people to understand knowledge, to a diagnosis about the stability of particular uh, constitutional organization. One such constitutional organization, in the short example from France I showed you, is about, you know, articulates meritocracy, a certain way of producing elites, a certain way of producing uh, uh, acceptable public issues, and how uh, expertise relates to uh, decision making. 
So to, to start this, uh, this reflection, I wanted to, to give, to share a few remarks that are, you know, mostly theoretical uh, considerations. And these theoretical considerations mostly come from uh, years of works in science and technology studies and other domain, domains. So these are the, um, some of the thoughts we might uh, want to, to, to keep in mind when developing this, this reflection. First, the fact that producing objective knowledge also means producing subjectivity, even if subjectivity is the fact that subje subjectivity ought to disappear behind the production of scientific facts. Producing objective knowledge is also about producing institutions, like the institutions whereby people like Jean-Marc Jancovici can graduate from certain schools and get the ability to say certain things about, uh, about reality. Then public expert expertise is always inscribed in arrangements in configurations that can be said to be constitutional in the dual sense of the term I was, I was mentioning, you know, constituting what public issues, what public problems are, and arranging the ways in which decision making ought to be, um, to be organized. Then the final step is that trust in expertise depends on the stability of these constitutional uh, arrangements. Well, we could go through all these uh, four points and have a very sophisticated discussions about how each of them relates to certain streams of work in STS, how it has been debated, how it could be perhaps rephrased in uh, relations to, uh, to other disciplines. Uh, but I want to reassure you, I won't going to do that <laughs> because I know uh, you're all very hungry because we're getting close to lunch. <laughs> Rather, I will uh, talk about one particular example to discuss the, um, the perspective I want to, um, to illustrate today. And this perspe perspective is about, you know, trying to understand the problem of trust through the problem of uh, constitutional fragility, trying to ident identify the areas, the domains where the stability of these constitutional arrangements is at stake. So the example I want to uh, focus on is uh, the, Euro the European one. And I'm, here I'm, I'm drawing on the recent book that Gil mentioned um, about European, uh, European objects. And I think European objects are extremely interesting uh, to look at because acting on and through technical objects has been at the core of the uh, European uh, policymaking. And yet they're also strange bureaucratic creatures, extremely complicated to understand, so, uh, very often at odds with you know, broader imaginaries of why uh, you have, of, of how certain uh, forms of public policy ought to be granted, for instance, in dreams of you know, objective science or the harmonized market. And to illustrate the ways in which the importance of European objects and you know, their political charge, so to speak, uh, here is uh, an, an example that I like. So I don't know if you have been following the debates in the UK about Brexit, but this is uh, an illustration. So I, I, I borrowed the picture from, uh, from The Guardian. And uh, so you've recognized Boris Johnson. This is in 2019 during the um, election campaign for uh, electing the, uh, the leader of the Conservative Party. And uh, Boris Johnson is here speaking to um, the party members. And the, the strange thing that is showing to, uh, to the people um, is called the keeper. It's, uh, so I'm not British, so, I'm, <laughs> so I'll let the British uh, people in the audience correct me if I'm wrong. But as far as I understood it, is a kind of a dried herring um, that is um, popular for certain people in the UK and apparently very popular for members of conservative parties. And, and the point that Boris Johnson was making at the moment is that the European regulation was forcing uh, British producers to add an ice pillow to these, uh, to these keepers. And that was completely at odds with what these people were doing, which was extremely costly, completely absurd in terms of uh, you know, environmental, the environmental value of this, uh, of this practice. And it worked. I mean, the audience loved it. Uh, everybody laughed, and apparently, you know, the humor of Boris Johnson is recognized by certain people in the Conservative Party, and it worked. Well, the day uh, after, uh, a spokesperson from the European Commission spoke, and she said, well, um, Boris Johnson talked about the keeper, but the exact regulation that he mentioned is not European, it's actually British. But we do have European regulations about fish. It's about the size of the label, 
you know, the um, the depth of the plastic wrapping. Uh, it's about the temperature in which the, the, the fish ought to be um, wrapped in these plastic bags, but it's not about the ice pillar. And everyone, uh, particularly in the Guardian, in, in, journal, in newspapers from the, in like the Guardian, for instance, were saying, oh, yeah, it's a, a blatant lie. It's an illustration of uh, how politicians like Boris Johnson just lie for purely electoral reasons. But of course, it's not enough because clearly uh, Johnson had a point, right? Because the ways, the, and, and the response of the European Commission is interesting, right? It's, it's, the person was saying, oh, yeah, it's all about the objects, it's all about the technical objects, but it's not the exact technicality that Boris Johnson was mentioning. The argument is clear. It's the, the ways of acting, the, the way of European invention through objects was exact, exactly what was at stake. It's the thing. Um, it's, um, you know, it illustrates the fact that it's actually the main source of perhaps constitutional uh, fragility. And there are many other examples where this um, problematic situation of European objects can, uh, can be visible. Uh, one, one illustration is the case of chemicals. If you look at the European regulation of chemicals, then you will see regulatory categories multiply. Uh, the, the approach is based on a case-by-case -case, uh, approach. Each case, each case of chemicals is, uh, is examined uh, in a dedicated public arena, bringing together representatives from member states and representatives from various stakeholders. And even in procedures that are main, meant to exclude chemicals from the market, then the case-by-case -case approach creeps in, uh, for instance, when exemptions are analyzed. So uh, to, to describe this case, I have been uh, speaking of regulatory precaution. Right? It's about uh, making, uh, using regulation to make the precautionary principle function, but also by being very precaution, uh, precaution, uh, precautionary with being very precautious with the regulatory uh, the reg regulatory constraints. So with examples such as this, it's, it, it works very, very well within a Boris Johnsonian framework, so to speak. I mean, it's a bureaucratic uh, nightmare, right? It's a very complex regulatory uh, machinery. It's a, it's a mix of science and politics. And, um, you know, it's completely undecipherable from the outside world. But then is the correct reaction uh, the mobilization of science, right? Do we want to say that we ought to purify scientific expertise from all this uh, complex regulatory landscape and just listen to the science? And then we would have a very good uh, regulation. Well, it's of course not that simple because the world of chemicals is crisscrossed with uh, scientific and social uncertainties. Uh, and having that sort of reaction completely ignores the ways in which the uh, European uh, regulatory um, bodies work. What is more interested, interesting, sorry, I would argue, is that first recognizing how European objects work in practice. So in practice, there is a specific kind of European objectivity, and one could describe it as interested objectivity. Of course, I'm aware that it's a total oxymoron, but it also says something of how expertise in Europe is produced, right? It's always a mix between technical examinations and political negotiations. And maybe then when we, when we do that, we can recognize that this practice of objectivity is at odds with a dream of you know, purified science being completely extracted uh, from politics. And from here, there is two reactions. The first one, which I think is not very productive, is to say that it is a failure of harmonization. It is a failure of mobilizing science. It is a failure of ensuring that science speaks truth to power. Maybe another more productive um, reaction to that is to recognize a situation of failure, but saying that the failure is about uh, imagining harmonization in different terms. Maybe the failure is about recognizing the sources of constitutional fragility and trying to work on the specificities of the European constitutional arrangements. And then the failure is about, you know, trying to uh, politicize objects in, way that are, in ways that are meaningful for the people that are uh, concerned with them. And people are concerned with objects. I mean, the, the members of the Conservative Party are very concerned about the keeper. People are very concerned about chemicals, but perhaps not about the multiple regulatory categories that the European policy produces, more about, you know, large-scale categories such as the forever chemicals that the media 
has been talking about at least in uh, at least in Europe. Maybe then the the challenge is to think about European objects as objects that matter. And the uh, interesting political task is to think about the ways in which these European objects can be made uh, objects that matter. And here, and I'll conclude with that. Um, maybe we are maybe we we get to a type of political analysis of expertise that takes at its core the ability to identify the sources of constitutional fragility, trying to work with them and trying to make them, you know, entry points to maybe rethink the role, the democratic, democratic role of expertise. In the case uh, of Europe, these sources uh, of con sources of constitutional fragility are related to uh, European objects. So then we might want to think about how to repoliticize European objects in ways that are that make them objects that matter. In other contexts, in other examples, that might be different. I mean, I said something about meritocracy and the production of elites in France and the ways in which uh, they are expected to produce the general will. Um, we could think about other examples we discussed today, for instance, quantification in the US and what uh, Andrew was saying about the, 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 the you know, the, the tension between cost benefit analysis and um, what is it, was it emergency use authorization? Yeah, uh, as perhaps a source of con constitutional fragility that might be interesting to uh, explore. So it's, I'll end with this call for future works, but also to, to say that there is perhaps a, a way of analyzing the politics of expertise that can be applied to other domains as well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, we have a discussant uh, for you, for the four speakers, particularly brilliant discussant. You'll thank me for that. Um, Alma Steingart is an assistant professor of history at Columbia. She has a NSF career award, a distinct honor, and very rare among historians. Um, before she came to Columbia, she was three years at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Her work is on the interplay between politics and mathematical rationalities. Her first book, Axiomatics, um, Mathematical Thought and High Modernism, has just been published by Chicago University Press. And she's already working on a second book um, titled, very appropriately for this conference, Accountable Democracy, Mathematical Reasoning and Representative Democracy in America. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Gil, for this uh, uh, introduction. Thank you for the invitation, and Tom as well. And thank you for the panelists for sharing your work. Um, it's been a pleasure to read and to listen today. So several, several years ago, um, I interviewed for a teaching position at some university. And among the courses that I proposed to teach was one which I entitled, What is Fact? Now, I meant it to serve as an introduction to STS and to the history of science. And I included in the reading some of the classics in the field, I should say several of which were written by presenters in today's conference. The course aimed to cover a wide range of topics from what is mathematical proof to the controversy over uh, climate, climate change. Now, after I presented my concept for the course, one of the interviewers smiled and said, but how do you make sure the message you send your student will not be that science is all made up? Wouldn't my course imply simply teach students that there are no such things as facts. And we already heard some kind of uh, echoes of those questions in the earlier, uh, earlier panel today. I must admit that at the time I was slightly taken aback by the question, I believed in science. In fact, like most historians of science, I love science. Uh, but that did not prevent me from also looking at science critically and questioning some of, some of its myths. Now, I do not remember, I should say, uh, how I replied, but the interviewers must have not been happy with my answer. I did not get the job. Uh, but in retrospect, what I should have probably done was send him to read Latour's Why as Critique Ran Out of Steam, uh, and many other works have been uh, published since then in the kind of SDS literature. But I kept thinking about this interaction as I was reading the papers for today's panel. With some slight variation, they are all addressing the question of how society right, can maintain and build trust in expert knowledge without also making the claim that experts are somehow privy to some supernatural powers. How do you build trust in expert knowledge while acknowledging that expert policymakers are humans like you and me, 
who operates with varying organizational structures and are subject to political and social forces that inevitably shape their work. Now, since as you already kind of uh, got a sense for that, each of the papers in this panel um, considers this set of questions from a different perspective and by uh, focusing on a different subject matter, what I decided to do is to focus my commentary on kind of three, what I see as three cross-cutting themes uh, that emerged as I was reading. So the first is uh, being crisis, question about crisis. The second is the role of judgment. Uh, and the places, and the third one is kind of thinking about the place of media in these accounts. So uh, crisis, political crisis, financial crisis, public health crisis, uh, not to mention the crisis of expertise uh, are increasingly inseparable from our lives and indeed our thinking about expertise. So what does the designation of crisis, right? What does the designation of crisis do for the construction of expert knowledge? Is crisis a state of exception for expert knowledge or whether it's raison d'etre? In Andy Laco's paper, the COVID-19 public health crisis mobilized a host, a host of experts. The pandemic, as you uh, explained to us, right, triggered a change in the FDA's regula regulatory process and made available the emergency use authorization exception. Thus, on the one hand, crisis seems to challenge expertise by departing from quote unquote normal regulatory uh, processes. Uh, it's open in other words, kind of open a gap in which competing vision, vision can emerge. While on the other, following Lakoff's analysis, it also provides an opportunity to, to reassert and reestablish expertise. Now, crisis and a challenge to expertise is also evident in Stephen Turner's paper. Here, the crisis is the 2008 financial crisis and the Greek debt crisis of 2010. According to Turner, the moment of crisis not only demanded that experts intervene in order to minimize the damage to financial market, but it also, this moment of crisis, provided a moment of self-reflection. Moreover, the immediacy of the crisis and the necessity for short-term action constrained the work of experts in the IMF and limited the horizon of potential intervention. Finally, Vice Laurent, and this is not from what he present today, but it's in the paper, he offers a third way in which crisis intersects with expertise when he describes in his paper how the European Food and Safety Authority was created in 2002 in response to the med cow crisis. Well, the agency's role was to restore, according to uh, Bryce, uh, restore trust in the European Commission's ability to deal with scientific and technical risk. It failed to do so by assuming this kind of view from nowhere. So all this attention to crisis made me think of Janet Troitman's anti-crisis, uh, her book, which explores crisis as an historical and philosophical concepts and shows how narrative uh, or how, sorry, how the narrative invocation of crisis opens up certain pathway for action and kind of opens up certain kind of lines of inquiry while foreclosing others. Moreover, looking at the financial crisis itself, Reutemann notes that the line, the, so the line between expert and lay knowledge was not necessarily easy to establish. And she kind of reflects on it in her book. As she writes, and this is a quote from her book, accountant and corporate managers are not necessarily academic economists, but are they considered layperson with respect to the financial analysis? Are lawyers, engineers, and mathematicians working in private non-financial firms or laboratories to be considered laypersons in contrast to academic economists and financial analysts? Are economic anthropologists housed in universities layperson in relation to their colleagues in economic departments? Such questions about whose expertise counts and where the line between expert and lay knowledge may be drawn were, of course, also evident during the early days of the, of the pandemic, where for a short while, everyone on the internet had something to say about epidemiology. Now, my question then, what role does crisis, right, as a narrative construction, what role does crisis play in the construction of trust and expertise? Following Reutemann, what sort of narrations are enabled and which one are foreclosed by the invocation of crisis? How does crisis redraw the line between expert and lay person? So, okay, second thing. The title of this panel is objectivity of this panel is objectivity and trust. But I wonder if a change of terminology might be constructive. So instead of thinking about trust and objectivity, 
um, and how they are construed in each paper, what I would like to do is to focus on the role of discretion and judgment. I believe that this change is useful as it points to two somewhat contradictory conception of expertise uh, that, we, uh, that we have. So on the one hand, we take expertise to reflect an individual's capacity to assert judgment and to exercise discretion. In other words, experts are exactly those who are positions to make decision based on their individual standing as professionals who have the necessary knowledge and the proper institutional backing. On the other hand, we take expertise to stand for the opposite. What makes someone an expert is precisely the accept expectation that they do not exercise personal discretion, right? But simply voice the facts. Experts might use their judgment when proposing a policy, but the assumption is, is that their individual standing is somehow irrelevant as any other expert would reach the same conclusion from the same given set of facts. So here, Porter's analysis of the myriads of ways in which expert judgment intersect with statistical metrics, standards, and indicator, I think is quite instructive, as it highlights in many ways the gap between objectivity and judgment. It is numbers seen as reflecting some kind of an objective reality that could potentially limit, and, or maybe limit or at least challenge, experts' judgment. In other words, expertise understood as the exercise of personal discretion is threatened by the rigidity of quantification. So be it if we're talking about the law school admission officers that is their expertise is being somehow challenged or limited, or if it's the American school teacher uh, uh, faced with uh, standardized testing. Porter's papers emphasize that quantification can have unexpected and unintended consequences, which raises the question of how expert judgment is formed and altered in light of the response to this transformation. So to borrow Ian Hacking's language, what sort of looping effect is in place here? The place of expert judgment is of course also present in the work of the other panelists. In particular, I wonder to what degree can refiguring judgment as standing not outside of politics, but on the contrary, as always incorporating the scientific and the political, can reframe our conception of expertise. And it's, this seems to me, this seems to me to be what Laurent is suggesting by turning our attention to the European model in which expert judgment is tied to the political representation of interest of the actors involved as one potential, sorry, uh, is, right, as one potential answer to the inseparability of politics and knowledge in the realm of kind of public policy. However, you can ask, can the same be said about the case Lakoff is presenting? The judgment of experts who fought to maintain regulatory, regulatory autonomy of the FDA pertained not only to suppose safety and efficacy, efficacy of vac vaccine, right? Questions, kind of medical question of how should we think about and how should we judge clinical trials, but also the judgment came in also in the question of how to process, how the process would be received by a wary public. In other words, externalities became internal to the formation of expert knowledge. Similarly, in Turner's paper, one can ask how would the reports look different if, for example, the IMF expert work, their work was judged not by their supposed ability to keep the political at bay, but rather to use their personal discretion to account for the political. Um, so the third point that I just wanna move very quickly on, which is, I wanna ask about the role of media. What strikes me upon reading uh, all four papers together is the role that media plays in your analysis. Well, I know that the next panel will be attending to this question. I know, I know it's coming, but I do still want to invite you to reflect on it more directly now. Media is an important factor in the construction and in the, in the construction and the challenge to expertise, uh, but it is often under theorized, I think, uh, at times. So the ability of medical professionals and regulators, in other words, to push against the Trump administration was enabled by the media coverage, right? And the public discussion of it. The ranking of law school was undertaken by a media organization, right? In Ted Porter's uh, uh, example, this is a media organization that was struggling to remain relevant in a changing market. The IMF reports were produced as much, the, as much kind of for internal as for an external consumption, legitimizing the organization demanded a public facing account. So how then is the changing media environment 
impacted the role of expertise in contemporary society. It seems that social media in particular has helped create and sustain the current, what we refer to until now, the crisis of expertise, although there's a question if there is a crisis, but can it also serve to bolster it? So I just wanna end by concluding on what I think is a more pressing issue right now. Uh, we are awaiting and hopefully kind of bring some of this together. We are awaiting right now the Supreme Court decision tomorrow regarding the availability of mefepristone to millions of women around the country. The crisis, right, this crisis, uh, initiated was initiated when a federal judge in Texas decided to overturn the FDA's more than 20 year long approval of the drug. And I was thinking about the issue while reading Lakoff's paper. I was wondering if the same coalition of medical experts, pharmaceutical executives and government regulators will be able to coalesce again to keep at bay the ideologically motivating attack on the drug. Will the fear that upholding Judges Kasmerik's ruling will inevitably undermine the entire regulatory process of the FDA, thereby making it conceivable that any judge can overturn the agency's procedure be enough, we, we, one hopes, be enough to convince the courts to do otherwise. Has the crisis in medical care women around the country are experiencing right now open any avenues that were otherwise closed? And what would happen if instead of fighting over quote unquote, objective safety of drugs, we would instead discuss whose judgment do we trust, right? Who do we want to speak about these issues? The current state of reproductive injustice in this country inexorably draws our attention to how deadlocks in expertise, legal, judicial, and biomedical, not only respond to crisis, but occasion great crisis. Thank you. Great, I invite the panelists to come uh, in front and um, maybe you can take turns in um, responding to some of the questions, provocations and thoughts that Alma um, raised. Um, and then if we have enough time, which we don't, we'll take <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Uh, is anybody, Andy, you got a lot of questions, so. Well, let I, I really appreciate that last, uh, all of the comments, but in particular that last question around, you know, can we think of this alliance as a kind of model? And I think it's intriguing because the, the and a model also of the sort of making explicit of the political dimensions of expertise um, that I think Bryce is also pointing to. So I, so I do think we are already seeing evidence of that kind of alliance. And I've, I've, I've you know, the drug industry has made, very quickly made a statement um, to the Supreme Court about the need to overturn Texas ruling. Um, and so while there's obviously a lot of differences between the cases, I think a generalization might be a realization among a heterogeneous group of experts that simply relying on the data to speak for itself is not going to suffice. And in fact, you know, it, it's going to be a political process to speak for um, the legitimacy of, of certain forms of expertise in certain domains. Stephen, thank you. Yeah, just, just let me speak to something that's an essentially off topic. I'll advertise my latest book, Making Democratic Theory Democratic, which is really also about this whole question of the delegation of expertise, exactly what the rule of law means in the face of uh, administrative discretion. And uh, I think this is one of the most fundamental democratic questions. So the definition of the rule of law is you can go to the common courts to correct the, the actions of the government. And that's what this case is all about. And it's very important because it's a question of where we uh, define what democratic power is as opposed to bureaucratic power. And uh, um, the, you know, the, the precedent is Chevron deference, which is, you just let the administrators do whatever the hell they want. And uh, that's led to all kinds of uh, pretty serious abuses, uh, but it's hard to say that the courts are the place to correct that. So there's, it's a fundamental knot in uh, democratic theory and also theory of law. So. I'll just say very brief. Thank, say very briefly. Uh, uh, thanks for the comment on media, which is indeed relevant uh, all over. And uh, in a way, the amazing thing about uh, about the um, 
the, you know, the law school cases that unlike, let's say the, we're gonna talk about the, the schools and all, certainly also this, uh, this um, you know, medical um, alienist um, that uh, these are people with, you know, claims to, reasonable claims to expertise, perhaps as much as anybody, you know, kind of uh, duking it out in a sort of equal term where all sides have uh, have a claim. And in the case of the, the law schools, there's actually, I mean, validity never really, I mean, that is, there were arts, art fights about the, the validity, but that's not what's going on. The I mean, the, uh, the law school deans were trying to, um, to uh, move the public the no higher authorities were really weighing in, um, and uh, um, the uh, uh, the uh, um, the results of these data projects uh, for law schools. You're kind of random. I mean, produce the produce the effect on their own, not necessarily even what the in a general way what what the um, the the, the, the um, um, journalists were looking for they would they were a little bit they, they did some judge some fudging probably to make sure they didn't humiliate themselves by having something you know something that everybody thought they knew proved to be false so yale law school was safe you know but mm -hmm. uh, but uh, um others that didn't it was didn't take a lot of institutional power or state authority or anything to disrupt the law schools it just took a kind of a process that drove itself uh you know, in a line, or you know, along along with the the work of the of this down in the dumps, as it, uh, it, when it began, that this down in the dumps, um, you know, um, uh, journalistic uh, the magazine. So, nice. Thanks a lot for the for the comments. So, um, I just wanted to to pick up on your first question about crisis because I do think it's extremely important to. Uh, problematize the diagnosis of crisis of expertise, because after all, I mean, what is it a crisis of, right? Is it a crisis of expertise being given and then we fail somehow to diffuse it to, uh, to other publics? Or is it a crisis related to how we uh, envision the relationships between the production of knowledge and the uh, broader social organization of how these collective decisions are, are made? And, and the European example is very interesting about that because I mean, in Europe, it's a very common trope in European studies to say that crises are opportunities uh, for broader integration. And for instance, people did say that Brexit was an opportunity to reinforce European construction, to make Europe stronger, to reinforce the single market. And of course, you could argue that formulating the, di the diagnosis in those terms just reinforce what caused Brexit in the first place, right? <laughs> because it reinforced the, the idea, the imaginary of a market as uh, disentangled from politics as a, uh, a, a, a resources in, in itself, with value in itself to promote European integration. Maybe um, it's interesting to shift this diagnosis of crisis to another, to another one in which the real crisis is about how to uh, define harmonization in different terms, how to take the actual regulatory practices of European institutions seriously, and perhaps go through um, ways that ensure that German objects, to reuse the terms I was using, are made objects that matter. Uh, Harid, was the question online? No, okay, so that, yeah, Paul. I have a <clears throat> question for, for Andy Leifob. Uh, the CDC was much less successful, I think, at least judging from what I've read, in being able to uh, ward off pressures from the White House than the FDA. Now, was that because of the nature of the decisions that the CDC was making? Was it because um, there was no alliance of the kind that you described in relation to the FDA. Mm -hmm. What accounts for the, the, um, basically the corruption <laughs> of the CDC, which didn't perform well anyway, but also was just much easier for the White House to manipulate. Yeah, it's interesting to, to compare the, the figure of the commissioner of the FDA uh, Stephen Hahn with the with the figure of the com the commissioner of the, uh, the the director of the CDC um, Redfield, uh, both of whom actually were quite weak um, in 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 resisting um, the 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 push of the administration to to manipulate science 
or scientific claims in certain ways. Um, I guess I would and I analyze this in, in two ways. One is that um, the CDC was less able than, I, I should say that actually scientists played a different role in each case, um, that, that scientists outside of government mobilized around the vaccination question in a way that arguably they didn't, they didn't quite mobilize around CDC directives. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that the, the media, the, each, each agency used the media in different ways. And I think the CDC didn't follow its own prescriptions on how you, how one is supposed to communicate risk to a public, um, that it, that it actually had followed in other, in prior epidemics and pandemics. And so um, this CDC actually did a, a, a quite poor job of communicating its guidelines to the public. I think in a way that the, the FDA probably did a stronger job of communicating what its role was to the public. Okay, if there are no more questions, in the interest of time and stomachs, I will call a lunch break. We are reconvening at 2.30. <laughs>